Then see that you join us for the party organizer.
Okay, dear participants, I hope that the discussion uh, of this morning were fruitful and arose for interesting for the one that are going to follow in this afternoon. After the tackling uh, the diplomatic aspect of the vision of the security export upon what is going to follow the pandemic time, the panel uh, you are attending now approach the issue of the economic crisis after the pandemics. As economists, I am uh, used to value resources and uh, what greater resources than the know-how and the professional opinion of the speakers. To maximize our, uh, our panel results, I uh, give the floor for uh, each speaker around uh, 10 minutes. And after that, after three, 30 minutes, uh, we'll have a discussion. I will, will, I will present for the first, the first guest, Mr. Uh, Livio Rogozinaru, State Secretary for the Business Environment, Minister of Economy, Romania. Mr. Rogozinaru has has a very vast experience in the economic field, and uh, we are looking forward in the, his opinions regarding the threats and opportunities for the regional economic cooperation. Mr. Rogozinaru, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Good day, everybody. First of all, I want to start with congratulations from Mr. Rector and his team, and the university, of course, because in these difficult times, you have the possibility and you find the opportunity to organize all this. Congratulations, Mr. Rector. Thank you very much. This initiative aims to promote cooperation first and foremost for the development of infrastructure in the energy, transport, and digital sectors. It's it targets the new investments, economic growth, and energy security. We reaffirm our support for the three Cs initiative and for achieves the common objective of expanding infrastructure strategy, business ties, strengthening energy security and reduction barrier to fee, fair and reciprocity trade in Central and Eastern Europe. Strengthening interconnectivity between the 12 participants states will contribute to increase economy economic convergence and cohesion between members of the European Union to the deepening of European integration and therefore to the stability and prosperity of the Union. We are convinced that, our object, that uh, the objectives of the 3C uh, will be achieved. The means, strong growth in economy, development, strategic to the cohesion, the cohesion in the European Union and reaching translation ties. The 3C initiative is a flexible political platform at presidential level launched in 2015. In this initiative, including the 12 EU member states, Romania is proud to be part of. Um, we, talk, we talk about the uh, uh, very strange war a strategic one, um, military maybe. I, I'm no specialist. We have enough generals here who are very, very good qualified to, to, have the, to, to, to know very well and to explain us what's happened. I say we have, um, I don't know if it's a war, but for sure it's a commercial battle. It's a, it's a commercial battle between the states. We have um, we have our, our possibility to win this battle. It's very difficult to, <clears throat> to have a battle, as the, the others say already, in the commercial fields, what I say. <clears throat> China, Russia, difficult to, to have now uh, a very good cooperation, commercial cooperation in the normal position. We must, we must to show to the people um, the, how to say, the apple who is poison. Because in, uh, you know, the, the, the poison apple now are the money, the business 
the business who give it to you the money to start something, and after that, it's uh, it's completely uh, completely uh, different in uh, <coughs> in the, what they ask it for. For that, I say it's very difficult in in this battle maybe not to win, to keep the battle. We hope very well to, to be uh, good enough to win also. Uh, I was in, in uh, Macedonia and Albania two weeks ago in a short visit, very interested and very important in my, in my opinion. Um, it's very important to know, maybe you have the possibility to, with these two countries, Balkanic country, very close to us, to Romania, to make strategy together, to help this country to be together with, uh, with us in the communion, European community. It's very easy to understand. Okay, Mr. State Secretary Pompelmo was two times in the next, uh, next two months. Uh, for sure, he's going there to, to have very good discussion. Um, but also for us, it's, uh, it's important to help it, these two countries, to integrate it in the European community, in the big family, European, the European family, from one side, commercial to, 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 to come with us. Because in my opinion, if we going in the global market, like a Balkanic market, we have more possibility to have good results than to go each one singularly in this uh, in this battle let's let's turn to the first idea um, we have a lot of things to do i i don't speak about uh, about defense i don't speak about that because it's not my my uh, i i'm not very good prepared in this in this area for sure are the others who are better Ten times more than me, uh, but for in my opinion, is very. I will come back to the economic uh, battle. What I call the economic battle because um, now everything is in. Uh, if if we leave the military part, everything is economy. If we have the possibility and we have the the intelligence to win in this common common battle. Uh, we, const we have the possibility to build better future for us in the first moment and for our children. Um, for the last, I want to transmit, transmit the, the... I'm sorry from Mr. Popescu, the minister who must be here, if you, I'm sure you know, everybody knows, uh, has pro health problem. But uh, of course, I, I want to, to say hello from everybody uh, to, from the side of Mr. Popescu. And thank you very much for your time. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Rogojinaru. Uh, like I said, uh, in the end of the panel, we'll have uh, questions and discussion uh, and uh, uh, will comment uh, 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 what you want about uh, this subject. Of course, many people said uh, it's an act of courage uh, to organize in the, this form of this conference, uh, but uh, uh, I think it's uh, a normality in uh, this uh, period. But uh, it's not only to West University from Timisoara fault because we organized this conference, uh, it's uh, the same uh, our partner, uh, New Strategy Center. and. Uh, in this uh, moment, I want to uh, say thank you to Mr. George Scutaru and Lionel Nisu because uh, they are uh, here uh, and uh, always uh, uh, with uh, our university. And this partnership uh, is working uh, from four years, and I'm surely in the future will be uh, the same. Thank you, thank you very much, George. Okay, uh, now uh, the second speaker for this uh, panel, Mr. Radomir Tylekot. Uh, I think it's in online with us. Mr. Radomir Tylekot is Senior Research Analyst, Institute of Economic Affairs, United Kingdom, 
will share with us his opinion on this subject, and I'm sure uh, that all his experience as advisor and uh, analyst published in the most important economic journal will transform his intervention into real opportunity for all here. Mr. Tylekot. Hello, can you hear me? <clears throat> Sorry, Mr. Chairman, could you Mr. let me know whether you can hear me? Okay, I will, I will begin anyway. I, I, I think you can hear me. So, um, I think it's most useful if I discuss general global issues that relate to some extent to the Balkans rather than Balkan specific issues. So, if you like, strategic before economic. Um, forgive me also if I focus a little more on the threats than the opportunities, but I think we have to understand threats to understand the opportunities for the region. And what I want to do is consider first um, not simply the origins of the pandemic, but the origins of the response to the pandemic uh, to, to help inform new attitudes to policy in the future. So the central point is what has created these economic threats through COVID. The first point here is I think the economic crisis and the coming regional and geopolitical results of this crisis have been caused much more by the response to the pandemic than by the COVID disease itself. So really, I'm discussing the economic crisis after the pandemic response. Essentially, and I should add, these comments are about most countries' average responses. They're not about Romania or the Balkans region's policy as such. But what has happened is essentially a highly unusual policy of lockdown that begin, began within China seems to have been normalized through the World Health Organization. And we need to understand how, because it could recur in future. First, is lockdown, I would start with a question, is lockdown a normal response to a virus of this type? And if not, what is new and why? So it's worth noting that the virus has a recovery rate of up to 99.75%. The average age of people who die of COVID is 82, which is above average life expectancy. And COVID is not more lethal than a new strain of flu. It's comparable, it's worse than average flu, but it's not more lethal than a new strain of flu, for which we didn't previously shut down the economy and didn't take away freedoms on this level to this degree. So how did the lockdown response first begin? It began in China based on Premier Xi Jinping's philosophy of Fan Kong, or health and security policy, in which the CCP began by confining 57 million residents in Hubei to their homes. And human rights observers expressed concerns about this. And one expert told the New York Times that the shutdown would almost certainly lead to human rights violations. But on the 29th of January, the WHO director, Dr. Tedros Adhanom, whose election was supported by China and who visited China first after being elected, said he was very impressed and encouraged by Xi Jinping's detailed knowledge of the outbreak. The next day praised China for setting a new standard for outbreak response. In its February report, the World Health Organization praised China's triumph in a rather politicized way. It said China's uncompromising and rigorous use of non-pharmaceutical measures to contain transmission of the COVID-19 virus in multiple settings provides vital lessons for global response. And national resources have now coalesced, or responses, I should say, 
have coalesced around the lockdown idea. So it's increasingly clear, I'm afraid, that the costs, and I'm speaking about the UK here, because I don't claim to be expert on uh, Central and Eastern Europe, but the costs in the UK increasingly seem to be worse than the benefits. So cancer death rates are rising because of resources being diverted to COVID. There are serious health impacts of job losses. And I'm afraid we're looking at political results probably down the line in the UK and other Western European and North American countries. Therefore, I suggest that the ongoing economic threat of the virus is not a biological phenomenon, but is a political phenomenon, and it's related to four factors in my view. We need to, um, I, if I seem to be emphasizing this quite strongly, it's because I, I think we need to understand these to establish the opportunity, including for the Balkans region. So the four factors. One, it started in China. Two, is the growing influence of China in international systems, such as the UN. Three, the influence of China at the WHO especially, and four, the harmonization of rules and responses by multinational organizations, which seems to reduce flexibility in response and competitiveness, a marketplace of ideas, if you like, in response. So the results I'd like to discuss are also the immediate threats for Europe and the Balkans in particular. First result of this that I'm concerned with is the expansion of China's Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI, into the Balkans and Europe. The Belt and Road Initiative is, of course, Xi Jinping's signature project and revolves around a system of Chinese foreign infrastructure ownership. It is now being promoted through Chinese offers to buy assets from increasingly needy sellers in the West. The next, the area I'm also concerned with here, is Eurozone stability as a result of COVID. I'm getting away from the China question here, but there is serious possible impact for the Eurozone and the Balkans through COVID. <clears throat> the pandemic, or the reaction to the pandemic in the Eurozone has triggered the steepest recession on record. Brussels will reintroduce fiscal rules for national budgets in 2022, in a little over a year. But the bigger problem is that private companies' balance sheets will continue to be in trouble. And if enough workers have been severed from their jobs and their training over the long term in these economies, this may mean a semi-permanent loss of economic productivity in the region and beyond the region. Now, related to this is a particular threat to the banking system. So EU banks are trading below book value, or were rather already before the pandemic, and they're in deeper trouble now. Why? Unemployment means falling fees, for one. So state credit and furlough support across Europe is keeping them going. But what happens after that starts expiring and we're left with a residual level, a lower residual level than now of long-term unemployment and, un um, and lack of productivity? So presumably there's likely to be a credit crunch as credit lines to vulnerable firms are cut off, especially as the second phase, phase of the pandemic and the response to the pandemic gets underway. So if loan conditions are tightened this coming year and 25% to bank, bank, bank to do so, similar conditions to 2007, which tipped Germany and Italy into recession, then financial crisis. So future growth in the EU and Germany especially relies on traditional bank lending, less venture capital compared to the US to some extent, the UK. And so we're looking at increasingly at an economic system that I'm afraid seems to be in limbo because of an overreaction to a very rarely fatal disease. So in sum, my suggestion is that the pandemic response and the resulting continuing economic threat to the region is a symptom of an emerging age of China in the international institutions. And the question is how we respond to it. First, the pandemic itself, 
with an overreaction that may cause much more damage in the long term than the disease itself, and by normalizing authoritarian responses that do economies harm in the long run. I'm not suggesting these responses, by the way, I'm simply describing them. The opportunity then lies in studying who has done best in their response. My view is that's Taiwan followed by South Korea. They are better institutionally prepared to deal with this. It's another longer discussion as to why. And this is a part of a more general and secular threat um, related to autocratic political policy. The countries like Romania in the Balkans, how might the Balkans, for example, respond? How might the region respond, including cooperatively? A few suggestions would be strengthened outreach to the Five Eyes intelligence community of the UK, US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand to develop a shared understanding of the challenge of Belt and Road Institute, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative post COVID, and strong technological integration with the emerging D10 Democratic Tech Alliance. So that's the G7 plus India, South Korea, and Australia. I discussed this in my recent paper that was out in August for the think tank Civitas here in London. The paper is called A Long March Through the Institutions, Understanding and Responding to China's Influence in International Organizations. And finally, I think there's a possibility to establish regional cooperative monitoring of the degree of Chinese and indeed Russian infrastructure investment and ownership, including debt-based investment that can lead to infrastructure control. Uh, I hope I haven't talked for too long, and I hope you don't mind my frank comments about the situation, uh, but I'd be glad to discuss all of this, and thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for having me. It was very interesting uh, intervention. Um, despite the physical distance, with the aid of the modern technology that keep us connected, we will be able to have with us in this next minutes, Mr. Octavian Stanku, Head of Cybersecurity and World Line Services Romania at Atos Romania, with a strong background in coaching, mentoring, and teaching inside the financial, business, strategic, and technical area. Octavian Stanku knows how to make people understand the importance of knowledge determination and respect. So share with us your insights. Hello, and uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's my pleasure being here. And uh, of course, in better circumstances, I would have loved also to meet uh, in person. Um, ATES is a global leader in digital transformation with uh, 110,000 employees in 73 countries and uh, in Romania ATS IT Solutions and Services is a global delivery center. We deliver end-to-end uh, -end services from 2011. We started with 450 employees and until present we have more than 2,700. So Several, several aspects will become more and more relevant, uh, like remote collaborative work will be a new social norm. Those who were adverse uh, to it will have to adapt quickly. And cybersecurity will be even more critical since uh, vulnerabilities are increasing. Traceability will also become a major issue. And technologies such as Internet of Things and blockchain could play an even more uh, preeminent role. Now, the post-crisis scenario, what are the recovery prospects? The COVID-19 crisis has been severe at human healthcare and society level, and the outlook is challenging in the short and medium term. It's already having deep economic repercussions for individual businesses and nation. In addition, it has come at a moment when the economic and financial scenario was already in somewhat of a turmoil. So some countries seem to weather the storm better than others, but it remains to see whether this will bring them productivity advantages or whether a global recession will overshadow their performance. The current virus outbreak is likely to be of several waves. Even if we manage to contain it now, it can resurface. Therefore, 
Despite the extraordinary monetary and fiscal measures announced, we do not expect a V-shaped recovery, but rather a U-shape, W-shape, or even L-shape recovery. Also, we expect a new normal, not going back to the normal. So important challenges ahead, activities like travel, tourism, retail, restaurants, cinemas have already been very hard to hit. Despite the extraordinary measures, many small and medium sized will be wiped out while unemployment is surging. We may see a number of private industries taken under public control. Financial markets, including currencies, will continue to be volatile. And some business to customer platforms have been hit hard due to the freezing of people mobility, while others uh, with a delivery or logistic focus have been better and are booming. So the crisis has shown that key aspects like digitalization, ultimately agility and flexi flexibility, or business continuity were not mature enough in many private companies. So is there a crisis model? In the ATIS Vision 2024, we, we analyzed in full detail this type of situation. And beside COVID-19, there are high uh, probabilities of disruptive events, which we call event horizons. Some of them potentially positive, but others potentially catastrophic, and all of them quite unpredictable. Also, huge disruption may be triggered by small changes, something that we have modeled as CUSPs based on mathematical uh, chaos uh, theories. CUSPs are surfaces that show how small changes in trajectory can result in either smooth outcome or deep discontinuities. And applying this model to the current crisis, we believe that effective crisis and crisis management efforts will enable the transformation of unpredictable event horizons into challenging but manage manage manageable cusps, which can be navigated with appropriate strategy and flexible execution. So customers will be attentive to this approach to prepare for future crisis management. In terms of cybersecurity and fraud management, the process of digitalization is providing great tools for security professionals. But it's also augmented the surface attack and uh, cheap access of powerful technologies to cyber criminals. Unfortunately, disruptions such, uh, such as the present COVID-19 emergency have been accompanied by surges in criminal activity sometimes even uh, targeted against those who are fighting in the front line or those who are most vulnerable. As technology becomes cheaper and better, the incentives increase, inequality and employment. With all this in mind, we do foresee a growth in fraud, both organized and individual. Fraud management is is going to require a multidisciplinary multidisciplinary approach and a broad range of possible solutions, such as digital identity, traceability, digital currency, artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, and others. Cybersecurity is in a difficult uh, but promising moment. It has many technologies at its disposal, identity and access management, biometrics, encryptions, but they are also available to criminals. So we are in a continuous race on both sides. In parallel, private and public organizations are in very bad shape when it comes to cybersecurity. Many are victims of ransomware, distributed denial of service attacks. Most do not even know the breaches they have suffered. Most do not have a strategy or fail to implement that strategy. When it comes to products and services, especially digital ones, security is quite often an afterthought. There is no security by design. Uh, it's true that there is a lack of awareness on this topic, but this is not the only or the most important problem. Security resources are scarce, and there is high dependencies on them to effectively practice cybersecurity by design and enforce corporate strategy and plans. The solution to this uh, conundrum could be a big opportunity, the democratization of cybersecurity automation and artificial intelligence can be used to enable many profiles to use cybersecurity as self-service of design, architecture, and tools. 
so what we do what do we do about it at the local level well we collaborate with with universities and it is cyber security master uh, program in brashov with english teaching was uh, launched to 2018 as a result of collaboration between ATAS Romania and uh, Transylvanian University. The program uh, is included in the curriculum of the Faculty of uh, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science and has a duration of two years. With the partnership ATAS brings, it it's, it brings its contribution by involving its Romanian and foreign specialists in the teaching process, but also creating specialization, specialized cybersecurity labs of course, mapped to ATAS portfolio. Also in Timisoara, we participate and collaborate with University Polytechnic of Timisoara. Uh, currently, we have uh, two hands-on teaching in computer networks. We are targeting uh, third year students. Uh, we are trying to put the basic of networking based on OC models and protocols. Also, um, we are participating in computer network security. Uh, here we are targeting the first year of master students, part of security information and cybernetic systems. Here we're talking about tools like Nessus and MAP, Azure Sentinel, Next Generation Firewalls, Palo Alto. Also, we have a collaboration with uh, the Student League, uh, pro uh, program contest, Unihack. We are sponsoring, sponsoring the web application tracker. And also, Anis scholarship uh, for professors. So uh, Anis scholarship program tries to stimulate the teaching abilities of young academics in the university environment by rewarding efforts to bring the, in the attention of the students the latest trends in technologies. The key of this project is to stimulate the training skills of young teachers to cover the technological progress gap in relation to adaptation effort to the curricula and to increase the interest of students. So in conclusion, agility and flexibility, we face a very challenging situation, probably leading to a new world, but with ample room for opportunity and change. Our response must not focus solely on immediate action. Since the crisis will trigger deep and lasting changes, we must focus on transformational actions those that will enable organizations to have even stronger positive in the new post-crisis world. In general, organizations need to pass the inflation point between uh, legacy focus to new business focus. Agility and flexibility will drive from data centricity, lighter process and high level of intelligent automation. Digital transformation and ecosystems must be a priority since they will be the lever for that transition from legacy to digital focus. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Stanko. Very interesting point of view. Thank you very much. Uh, as, we, as we can see, even though the field of activity of the, our speakers from today are very different, their point of view are completing one another and uh, set the premises for the future reflection and uh, discussion. Our next speakers, Ms. Ana Maria Boromisa, is head of Department for International Economic and Political Relation at the Institute for Development and International Relation in Croatia. Her research interests include trade policy, energy economics, and environmental economics, and we are very interested to see what you consider will happen the next with the world's economy. Please, Mrs. Boromisa. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. You. Uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, so it's very my pleasure to share my views uh, today, David, to you on economic crisis after pandemic, threats and opportunities for regional cooperation. I decided uh, to structure this short presentation in three, three, three parts. One relates to immediate response to pandemic, the second economic crisis during pandemic, and the third, which is the title of our panel, the economic crisis after pandemic. So the 
possibilities and prospects of uh, ending the economic crisis after pandemic depend on the first two parts. So how do we respond immediately and how long does it last? And those are issues we don't actually know and we are trying and doing probably our best and we have some, as we heard previously, reservation whether we are doing our best of just copy pasting some answers which were designed somewhere else in some other societies and under different different circumstances and context which might or might not be quite suitable for the uh, region we are studying and focusing on so um, in response to the COVID-19 many countries have decided to act alone and the initial instinctive reaction was uh, to look, in, look inwards, uh, act alone, close the borders uh, and uh, disrupt supply chains, uh, cut down some, some of the uh, economic activities, especially those related with uh, cooperation with neighbors, which uh, led to the severe crisis and led the governments to design big stimulus packages and to try to alleviate those negative effects. However, very soon uh, pr prominent experts as well as international organizations launched the ideas that global coordination is needed and also a re regional answer to, the, to answer the crisis. So this includes working across borders and sh to share at least best practices to mitigate the spread, coordinate fiscal measures and boost trade. So we have those different aspects, one related to health issues and then related econo economic issues. So coordinating the positions in terms of uh, coordinating research or a common purchase of uh, vaccines, which are still under, under development, are some kind of regional answer to the global threat and still countries are trying somehow um, divided between inward looking and uh, having the bigger pictures and trying to cooperate being, uh, provide some solidarity and uh, coordinated actions. So uh, UN also recognized the needs of solidarity and uh, to fight common enemy. Similar wording was used by the European Union, uh, stipulating the importance of international cooperation among scientists and economists and policymakers. So not just focusing on uh, health issues and trying to find a solution and cure or vaccine to treat or prevent the virus, but also to tackle uh, other aspects which uh, affect societies and uh, regions. So, um, European Parliament also asked for solidarity and prepare for long-term measures. So, it was immediately quite obvious that despite those short-term actions and attempts to close down countries for a couple of weeks or a month, that the impacts will be lost lasting and the recovery will be slow and somehow painful. However, as every threat is also opportunity, it has been become quite obvious that sharing the knowledge, best practices and uh, some kind of coordination is necessary to be effective to fight the, uh, fight the support still. Uh, while the stimulus package has been designed on the EU level, basically all the uh, funds have been directed to the member states. So the regional dimension is a bit neglected, in, uh, apart from the fact that there is an effort to, uh, in research. But the financial stimulus measures and measures for SMEs and uh, recovery of the economy are basically national ones. So. Uh, regional collaboration which would support this kind of national action is still miss, uh, missing and there is seems to be a problem in balancing as in any economic policy short-term measures with long-term strategy and especially as we see the issues emerging from the balancing of European Green Deal with immediate response to the pandemic. So the measures and goals for 
reducing the, for instance, plastics and pa packaging waste in the time of pandemic when those materials are used for protective equipment are somehow not quite balanced. So uh, to sum up, the pandemic has uh, stipulated that it is necessary to uh, have continual regional cooperation and it is necessary to build confidence and share knowledge uh, on issues of on, on regional uh, relevance, so which includes exchange uh, lessons, uh, identify urgent investment needs and mobilize resources. Uh, one of the issues which has previously not top on the agenda for regional cooperation is regional health cooperation and probably harmonizing the criteria for some kind of measures to be introduced. And still, as uh, Radomir previously said, copying the me measures is probably not the best options, but learning from somebody else's experience could be quite beneficial. And beyond the pandemic, cooperation will need to address the climate change, uh, build disaster resilience. We are aware that not only the pandemic is taking place, that all, all, all different security issues are emerging, uh, including natural disaster like earthquakes or uh, rays of um, terrorist attacks. So uh, building resilience is one of the issues which also requires regional cooperation. And this is something which uh, inward looking short term solutions uh, uh, is currently not addressing uh, adequately. And of course, the, the duration and severity of the crisis after the pandemic depends heavily on how long the pandemic will take. Some of the estimates uh, made by Asian Development Bank show, uh, show dramatically different results uh, depending on duration of the pandemic. So uh, some of the solutions which require regional cooperation is related to building a more resilient regional public health system, which includes basically in, uh, sharing information and uh, regional integrated disease surveillance networks, uh, more more coordination and full uh, procurement uh, mechanism for treatment or vaccines. This is something which is already being discussed or quite advanced on the EU level. But uh, some of the regional cooperation regarding uh, maybe better distribution networks is still uh, an opportunity to be. Uh, examined. Then uh, the second is support for regional economic revitalization. And it not only the issues which were being tackled before the pandemic, like uh, energy and transport networks, but also uh, new participation in this, uh, we can call them now almost traditional issues, but also uh, digitalization and uh, exchange of information are becoming higher on the agenda. And probably the most uh, important change or more, 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 uh, more, uh, more most visible change is uh, facilitation of knowledge sharing and policy coordination. We saw that this was not uh, done in a coordinated way, but more like coping the solution. So when everybody closes down, the countries which are still functioning as somehow feel peer pressure to close down also. And this is something uh, I think I agree quite a lot with Radomir that this kind of issues are the key for a successful uh, transition from uh, pandemic state to new, more stable and normalized situation. So, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Boromisa, for uh, this speech. Uh, I will invite uh, now uh, to one of the biggest friends of the West University of Timisoara, the general manager and VP operation at Flex Romania, one of the most important and biggest uh, employer in this uh, region, to share with him, with uh, us, uh, his experience in uh, 
business, uh, I can say, around uh, Europe. Uh, he was uh, in previous uh, CEO Mille in the branch of. So, Mr. Alexander Klein, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. So, thank you for the invitation, first of all. And I have a chance to talk in front of this uh, audience here about uh, the industry perspective. It's always difficult to catch the audience after lunch break, so uh, I thought like we <laughs> have uh, prepared the presentation also uh, to catch a bit uh, the, the attention of the people. Mm -hmm. As long as the technology will allow us, uh, I think uh, we are going to have here also the presentation now. So, as you see, I'm going to talk about the future challenges on the labor market security. Uh, and as you already mentioned, I mean, we are one of the biggest suppliers, Flex, uh, in, in this region here. We have more than 4,000 people are employing here in, in Timisoara, in, in the city. And, and as such, I think uh, the topic is also uh, an actual one in the, in the current uh, crisis about, okay, how we are going to see a uh, future in... So I have to do this next slide. Uh, come on, I pick up more. <laughs> I have to go in presentation mode, or whoever is presenting this one. Uh, so, first of all, why uh, are we talking here about, uh, an, on this convention about uh, job security? Because uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a connectivity between uh, the uh, jobs available, the quality and the impact on the individual household and the income, uh, resulting into this one also in the uh, consumption and the GDP. And uh, as such, as you see like the circle on the right side, you have also a little bit of picture about this. It's resulting into a more stable economy and environment with less threats. So if you have a stable uh, jobs, if you have a good income, uh, you have uh, uh, consumptions, uh, people are more happy, and as such, uh, this is also like uh, creating a more stable environment. Next. You have to move a little bit up the slides. It's not, look at it. We, we have, have enough, we have, we have enough time, no problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, uh, I see half of my slide. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> everybody else is half the slide. You have to move a little bit. Okay, how's, uh, job secure, uh, how secure will be jobs in the uncertain future? Because uh, everything is changing, Ch times are changing. Next. I'm getting less and less of my slides, my friend. <laughs> are you doing that one? <laughs> are you doing this? Or are you, are you doing that one? Because uh, I don't see, the people don't see the slides. Who is present? Who is uh, doing this one? Are you doing that one? Yeah. But look. Here. From here. He have here. I see yeah. half of the slide. You have to go in a presentation mode. Yeah, it's because of the PDF. No, no, it's because of the presentation mode. Anyhow, scroll up a little bit. As I say, like, as long as technology allows us. Very good. Okay. At least I catch your attention in the half slide, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so how, how supply and demand is uh, in the equilibrium uh, to each other. So customer behaviors are changing in the, in, the, in the times nowadays. As such, the demand of the, uh, to the Jobs is changing as well. So jobs have to change, and the supply to the customer has to change. So it's all connected with each other. So uh, the labor market is highly influenced by of, uh, how the customer behavior is changing, what are the requirements to the market, and as such, how we as an industry and how the jobs will react on that one. Next slide. So everybody is talking about Industry 4.0. So what does this mean, actually? And uh, what is this buzzword all about? Next one. Okay, every industrial revolution led uh, to a change in the working world. So if you're talking about industry 4.0, actually you would have to divide it in two aspects. One is industry 4.0 and one is work 4.0. So you see the tech part and you see the work part. And if you see like from, in the, from the first industrial change, which was in the late 18th century, it was about uh, mechanization, the uh, beginning of industrial work. Uh, then the next uh, industrial revolution was about electrification, division of labor uh, tailorism. The third uh, uh, change in the Industrial Revolution was about more auto automation that was in the early 1970s. Computer-aided works, so the computer started then. And nowadays we are in the, in the fourth uh, Industrial Revolution, therefore Industry 4.0. But again, I would differentiate it in Industry 4.0 and Work 4.0 because Industry is about tax requirements like net networks and the Work 4.0 is about digitalized work and environments. Next slide. So uh, if uh, we are quoting Albert Einstein, what is insanity? Is uh, doing the same thing all over again and expecting different results. So the world is changing as such we have to change. We cannot expect doing the same things over and over again and expecting different results. So we have to change. Next slide. 
So uh, again, we're coming back to industry 4.0 and the work 4.0. And now I, a little bit spread it up that you can get an idea about when we're talking about industry 4.0, work 4.0, what we're actually talking about and how the change is going to happen. Because in fact, we have to change and adapt. Through the previous slides, what I've presented, you've seen already like behaviors is changing, people have to change, jobs have to change. So industry 4.0 is addressing different aspects in our, in our work environment, like robotics, digital twins, drones, conditional monitoring, and then, then. You can read it through. I can uh, share the slides also with the audience afterwards. The same on work 4.0. It's about like uh, competence management, uh, change of culture. So actually it's very important. We all have to change the way how we're doing things, the cultural approach in the companies and how we will address the jobs in the future. Demograph demographic recruiting, leadership style, uh, performance measurement, shop floor assistance, organizational collaboration, and office assistance systems. So this is all when we're talking about work in the current environment and the changes. So the technology is evolving, but also the way how we're going to work in the future has to change and has to evolve. Next slide. Okay, how did actually the COVID pandemic influence these changes in the labor market? Uh, actually, it's an accelerator. It's not a, a threat as such. It's a threat at the same time, but I think it's also an opportunity. So if you have been thinking like, and I was talking about the industrial revolutions at the force uh, 4.0 and work and in, in industry itself. So we have been already on the way doing that one. It's just like COVID came in between, let's see it like this. And it's actually under brackets helping us to accelerate the process what was already ongoing. Uh, companies will be challenged uh, and more willing to digitalize the processes in order to remain competitive on the market and profitable. So we're talking about creating competitive advantages. Next slide. So now, how, how would you see the, the different way of working, the digitalizations, uh, the working, uh, uh, working independence of place, time, and structure? This cube, cubically is showing you basically three different dimensions. So you see like the time, the structure, and the place. And if you go uh, in, the, in the historical or classical way, you'll see it like uh, the, the black dot where the classical way is like, it's a, a fixed workplace with a specific time, and a, fix, uh, and a fixed structure of, uh, of working. So the classical way how we have been doing the past things. And if you would go in a complete third dimension out and say like you get completely crazy, you do actually work wherever you want, whenever you want, and with whomever you want. So things are changing from a classical way of agile uh, project management, co-working space, virtual teams, crowdsourcing. So these are all these buzzwords in between. So you can actually see like where you want to position yourself in the three dimensions and what gives you the competitive advantage for the future. Next slide. Okay, how the local labor market will be impacted. Uh, people will re work more remotely from home. So actually we have seen already the facilitator like pushing people, staying home, pushing, uh, giving people the opportunity to work from home. Actually, uh, that will become uh, more and more a practice. More jobs and uh, high skilled workers uh, is becoming more and more important. Access to the global market uh, is, uh, is getting also more open because of the digitalized way how we're doing things and flexible working hours uh, as well. So is it a threat or an opportunity, the current uh, uh, approach of uh, uh, or the current pandemic? As it's, it all depends on how we're going to approach it. Okay, how are we going uh, to decide uh, the future of the labor market? Actually, it's a uh, combination or a, a, a collaboration in between the individuals about the companies and apparently by the government. Now, how are we going to uh, address those points uh, and how to link it with each other? Next slide. So individuals, uh, we have to learn how to adapt to the current situation. Uh, so in, if you're looking for studies in the past, the average person uh, has, uh, will have an, around 11 to 12 jobs in the, in the lifetime. In the past, our parents probably had like one or two jobs. They started in one company, they ended in one company, and probably their kids have been starting in the same company doing the things again. Flexibility is becoming a key word. Le learning is becoming a lifetime endeavor. So you cannot do any more one thing and then stay with the same job for your lifetime. It will challenge you. It will require to change the way how you're learning and developing yourself. So you see also on the right side here a little bit this, this curve about like continuously improving your skills and developing yourself, changing your jobs. Another example like probably in the past our parents had one, two cars. Nowadays we are going to change very often our cars because actually it's becoming almost like a mobile phone. It's becoming new, it's changing permanently. So the requirements are changing and it's leading back to the previous slides what I was talking about. The customer behavior is changing so the jobs have to change as well. Next slide. Okay, companies also need to rethink their business processes. Uh, we have to become more agile in the way how we're doing things uh, in the future. 
So we need uh, to use innovation, product development, and changing internal processes. Uh, we have to drive uh, entrepreneurship uh, or entrepreneurship in order to become more agile. Uh, need to rethink the business models, how we're working nowadays. We have to uh, leverage on high-skilled knowledge workers. So uh, everything becomes a kind of connectivity with each other, as I was also ta talking about uh, before. So innovation is invention plus the market change. Right? Next slide. Okay, how uh, the government uh, can connect uh, to this uh, uh, triangle. Uh, so actually, the government should become a catalyst to the change. Uh, so the universities, educational systems, uh, they are going to become a partner in between individual industries uh, and should help us uh, to enable uh, and grow the knowledge of uh, the people. Uh, to, uh, and actually, this is also to cope with the new challenges uh, of this uh, economical environment. The excellent centers for dedicated fields can be, for example, uh, developed so that the region becomes known for its specific activities. Also, when we are here in Timisoara, we are talking about this, how we can develop and grow in this area. So the future is actually here. We just have to see like, what we are going to make out of it. And on the last slide, a short summarization of what I was talking about. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, how secure will be the jobs in uncertain futures? Uh, so jobs will be more and more fragile. Uh, there will be the low-skilled workers apparently are going to have more challenges uh, because automation is becoming more and more dominant. But it's not a threat. It's also an opportunity at the same time because I was talking about like how individuals can involve, how we can connect uh, to local institutions and universities. The learning becomes an endeavor of the lifetime. So uh, there's a lot of measures what they, uh, can be taken um, on, on actually skilled workforce because it will also enable us as an industry to develop and grow uh, faster and be more flexible in the future. Uh, so also the knowledge workers uh, will create job security uh, with extremely highest level of specialization gives them access to the global, global market. That means also like if you're developing yourself, if you're growing your knowledge, you will have also more access to the global market uh, itself. Yes, that was my presentation. I hope I stayed in my timeline. I hope it was uh, interesting and uh, there will be a lot of questions out of it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much, Alexander. A very interesting presentation. Uh, and no, but uh, not the least, I will invite Mr. Adam Eberhardt, director of the Center for Eastern Study in Poland, to share with us his opinion. Please, Mr. Eberhardt. Great. Great. Thank, you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Great to see you. Uh, I, I regret we could not meet in Timisoara, but maybe next year, who knows. First of all, thank you very much for invitation. The topic of the session is quite right because it is about the economic crisis after pandemic, but it is also about regional cooperation of uh, countries of our region, countries of Central Europe and the Balkan uh, region. Uh, how will the pandemic influence the perspectives of the cooperation between uh, our countries and what are the prospects, what are the main challenges we uh, will be uh, facing in the coming uh, months. Well, let me, let me start with one observation that we have been living in times of, of turbulence even well before the pandemic started. And uh, we have been uh, facing a serious systematic uh, crisis in our world for at least several years. There were several reasons behind it. It was due to the growing threats from our opponents it is revisionist policy of, um, of Russia trying to uh, undermine post-Cold War uh, order, but uh, mainly it is about China emerging as a more assertive uh, global superpower. But it is also unpredictability, not only growing threat from the opponents, but it is also growing unpredictability of our partners. It is uh, challenges we have been facing in transatlantic relations, uh, under President Trump's administration, tensions, growing distrust between NATO allies. Uh, it is a crisis of European integration. There are many symptoms. One of the symptoms was Brexit, which showed us that European Union is not just about enlarging, but the borders uh, may go uh, reverse. 
Uh, it was a migration crisis, which has a huge impact on uh, trust between the countries of European Union, but also at a domestic level, trust of societies vis-a-vis uh, -vis European uh, decision makers. Uh, and a, a huge Eurozone crisis also, uh, also a problem and inability of European Union to keep European uh, open doors policy. Uh, a prolonged process of European integration of the countries of the Bal Balkan uh, regions with uh, doubtful prospects, uh, let's put it uh, uh, that way. Uh, it is certainly the, the crisis I, 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 I try to describe is a result of many different complex factors. It is also, it is, it is about new technologies which trigger transformation of uh, societies, of identity, new ways of circulation of information. People do live in their bubbles. There is an ongoing process of ideological polarization uh, within societies. We have been witnessing it in, 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 in the United States, for instance, with, uh, with uh, riots and, 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 and confrontation uh, 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 at uh, internal uh, level. And certainly all, all these negative trends will be increased, intensified by COVID pandemic's consequences. It will be about US-China comp uh, competition, Cold War competition, one could say. It will be about deep economic crisis, which was somehow mm, discussed by, 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 by my colleagues. Uh, it is about people frustration also at national level which will be linked to a deep economic crisis to, 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 to all these consequences of the, of the pandemic we, we, started, we, 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 have been, we have been witnessing for, for half a year. Well, I, I use the term a new Cold War. Certainly there is such a temptation to name new phenomena with old, uh, old labels. But, uh, but, but certainly, um, U.S.-Chinese uh, competition uh, will differ from an uh, uh, American-Soviet one. It will not be rooted in ideological disputes in the same way. It, it will not be clearly politically motivated. Um, division between two worlds, uh, it, will be, it will be much more complex. Uh, but uh, what I believe is likely to happen, it is a gradual uh, emergence of a uh, technological iron curtain. So, so, so the present uh, sharp dispute over the development of 5G internet technology show, shows us how, how, how tough such a competition might be. And it will expose uh, smaller states, states of our region also, to the risk of yielding to the pressure of from superpowers, uh, in particular in the context of a likely economic uh, depression triggered by the coronavirus uh, pandemic. It will also certainly reshape European integration. Uh, there will be uh, intention to cherish strategic autonomy by European Union in a situation of an uh, increasing American-Chinese competition, uh, I, I believe it will provoke strongest states, biggest states of, of European Union to, to, to make some decisions uh, which, which uh, uh, about the European integration, to take some measures will, which will have serious consequences for the countries of Central and uh, Eastern uh, Europe. Uh, at a, at a, at a, at a for foreign, foreign relations uh, level, what we what we will be witnessing is uh, uh, it was also also mentioned uh, by one of my colleagues. Uh, so we will uh, see a competition who will control the strategic flows, uh, supply chains, uh, chains, uh, infrastructure, and it certainly has a strong uh, economic, political, and security components. Uh, and, and, and uh, it is something our countries, countries of the Central Europe, countries of, of Balkans, should uh, somehow rethink and, and, and find out some uh, solutions. Uh, what I, I believe, and now I would like to move to the second part of the, of the, of the, of, of the session. So it is about the consequences of the pandemic for re regional cooperation. We are, our, our region, Central Europe and the Balkans, 
we face similar challenges and uh, there has been a growing uh, need for a new for new formats of uh, cooperation it, it is not about one initiative it is not about one framework it uh, there is room for different frameworks some of uh, of them will overlap each other uh, but and they will try to enhance cooperation between countries in in, in different uh, angle but but what is important i, I believe is that uh, countries of our region have been focused about east west connections for 30 years we were thinking how to get back to the europe to the western europe how to how to in, improve enhance uh, economic uh, cooperation uh, with western uh, european countries what we really lack is lack of infrastructure on north south corridor it is uh, stretching from Baltic uh, Sea, from Baltic states, Poland, uh, V4 countries, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, and, uh, and, and Western Balkans as, uh, as well. For many years, we have developed many formats of cooperation. Uh, uh, there is a V4 cooperation, V4 plus cooperation, it is a Bucharest 9 cooperation about more, more, more focused on security issues. There are macro regional European Union strategies, such one as concerning the Danube region, the Baltic uh, region. Uh, we, we, we have Central European Initiative as well as some high level uh, groups of sectoral cooperation also we should be under under uh, 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 underlined for instance central and south european energy connectivity gas platform and and others and and what we should do is to cherish all of them in order to see an added value to to increase a cooperation of our countries in time of a growing competition of uh, major political uh, actors. I would like to turn your attention to, to, to a project which seems the most promising and flexible. It is a three cities initiative launched in Dubrovnik uh, four years ago, a new format of cooperation, mainly of, well, not only of European Union member states, 12 European Union member states, uh, three Baltic states, before Romania, Bulgaria, Croatia, Slovenia, uh, and and Austria, uh, but 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 there are uh, it is it is certainly mainly about infrastructure. It is about North South corridor. It is about making use of uh, China Europe uh, uh, transport corridors in order to make hubs to create hubs in our region in order to 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 to, to get more added value for, for for our region and even though the three cities initiative is about european union countries only there is a good room for maneuver in order to increase uh, an added value uh, towards our neighbor neighbors from balkans uh, from ukraine uh, and and other other countries so it is it is it is something we will we will be uh, focusing ca our countries in the region in, in in coming months and years i believe because the situation we i we, which i what i wanted to outline uh, makes us to 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 to, to find a uh, response for the for for the challenges we have been facing uh, well before the coronavirus uh, pandemic but uh, it will be it will be it will be even more important uh, these days building stronger ties north north south uh, connections linking will 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 make uh, our region stronger thank you thank you very much uh, mr uh, eberhard um, this was uh, the whole presentation from this panel uh, uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, now I hope uh, all the speakers are uh, with us, are still with us uh, in online, uh, because uh, two of the uh, I can see here, because we have uh, no session of uh, Q&A, uh, questions, answers, and uh, discussion. So please feel free. Yes, 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 please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Hello. Hello. Right, of course. Yes, you have to come in front and stand in front of everybody. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs>
That's okay. So, so uh, this question is for uh, Mr. Stanchu. Can can you hear me? Are you still uh, Are you still online? Can you hear me? Uh, I cannot hear you. I don't know if you hear me. So. Okay. So, uh, so, so this question is for uh, for uh, Mr. Sanchu, and uh, it's, this is David Carstens. I'm with the U.S. Embassy. So, so the question is about your very uh, detailed uh, information on cybersecurity uh, threats and opportunities. So, uh, I was very interested to hear about your transformational actions, but I would like you to comment on two transformational actions that you didn't mention. So, so one is um, one is about policy uh, and laws that govern cybersecurity. So, we'll start in in Romania. So, since cybersecurity threats uh, do not know borders, uh, would it not be best to create the policy, the laws that allow for better sharing of cybersecurity information? between, say, Chert Row, Chert Mill, uh, because the, the current cybersecurity laws are, are extremely old. So, in other words, as Herr Klein suggests, making government the catalyst for change by, uh, by revamping the cybersecurity laws that allow for better sharing of information. But that's inside of Romania, regionally, since cybersecurity threats do not know borders, is it time to uh, think about a regional security or intelligence sharing apparatus that includes cyber int, where from a regional perspective, we can share information about the cyber threats and then work collaboratively to uh, attack and defend against, I'll say defend against those cybersecurity threats. So Mr. Stanchu, thank you for your response. Okay, thank you for your question. Can you hear me now? Can you come? Okay, okay, it's okay. Okay, okay so I'll try to split the answer in two because some, somehow the, the question is also in two. So, yes, policy and uh, regulating cyber. Cyber security is renowned and this is one of the strong and the weak points that is extremely volatile and and uh, i have a phrase it's constantly changing so we can rely that it will change so having classical regulation approach on it it's it's uh yeah it's it's, it's not moving fast enough and uh having uh, one um, big boom approach again it's not applicable also in this region because we have multiple players in, uh, involved. So what I can best recommend here, because of course the government is, is the final, he's the catalyst, but the government is the final entity that will enforce those, those law based on the country. What we can do as a company is uh, sit together at the table at advice based on, on best practices and what we see. But at the end of the day, each country has to enforce its own law. Uh, Private companies such as ours can have a, a saying at the table if we are invited to do so. But uh, other than uh, sharing our, our common best practice and uh, be involved in, in building projects, um, at the end, I still believe that the final, uh, final ball is in the government's yard. Okay, they can be the catalyst, we can advise them, we can uh, draw something, but they have to enforce it. And regionally, it's even it's even hard because uh, regionally, a lot of countries need to be aligned. And I've been mentioning traceability in, in, uh, in my presentation. Given the current cyber war, traceability, it's, it's crucial because we can state that this attack happened from here, this attack happened from there, this country is attacking this country, 
but even the attack itself can be masked. It can be double attack. One country can attack a country and using a false identity of another country. So it's ex it, it's extremely driving in, in political tension. So coming back, having uh, one approach, big boom, one rule uh, to, to regulate all, I think it's not uh, flexible enough. Uh, I think it's not uh, adaptive enough. So I would recommend, okay, maybe with the input from, from private companies such as ours, government should, uh, should stay at the table and draw laws and draw regulations, but they should do it fast and not necessarily uh, fixing everything with one law, but rather incremental and flexible and adapt and try and error. I hope I've answered your question. Yeah, thank you very much. So, other questions, please? Okay, please. Uh, I have a question I wanted to ask. From the very beginning of this pandemic, uh, countries were fearing the, the bad economic uh, reactions after the COVID. Uh, therefore, lots of people from the Balkans uh, countries living uh, in different other European countries are forced to go back to their countries. This is going to impose extra pressure on their home countries. Uh, do you think that uh, the well European Union should support these countries for this extra pressure on their already feeble economies? Thank you very much. Uh, to whom is it addressed? Also to me, this question or other speaker? Can you hear me now, please? Sorry. Can you confirm? Uh, to a certain extent, yes and, and, and no, I would say, because, I mean, maybe there's also an opportunity, I always see from a, from a positive, positive perspective in it, right? I mean, there's a threat and an opportunity at the same time. Okay, depends on what kind of qualification, what kind of type of people, what kind of jobs are coming back uh, in, in, into Romania in this case. So I see like a, lo a lot of good people have been maybe lost in the past going out of the country. Maybe they're coming back now. So we should see those from a, good, uh, from a positive perspective. At the same time, maybe, and I was talking a little bit about continuous learning, maybe the EU should also support it in, in a certain way to develop specific skills uh, for those people what are needed in the local industry, because local industry might be different in Romania than in Germany than in Austria or whatever. So, so yes, uh, I would say yes as, as such, uh, but uh, in a controlled way and again in collaboration with local institutions, I think uh, we can uh, work close together, industry and local institutions, universities to develop these people and develop people's skills. Yeah. And any financial support from the EU would be for sure welcome on that, definitely. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. I have questions for uh, Mr. Rogojinaru. Which were the threats that were transformed by the Minister of Economy into opportunities to lead to a new form of regional cooperation? Yeah, it's a... So the Minister of Economy tried to do something different than we are doing until now. Uh, what means that? We want, to, we want to start another kind of uh, promoting Romania, and not ru only Romania. Exactly what I say for us, we try to promote it, to, to create it a uh, uh, Balkan area right. in, the, in uh, the direction to have, let's say, Romania will be like, a, not control point, uh, one of the charging points from also from the other country, we collect the, the stuff here in Romania and we try to make all, uh, all the export from, from here. What I say that, 
because, because it's more easily. First of all, second, we have a, a, a good discussion now with Albania, for example, right. to create it to the, to the Mediterranean Sea a port for us, for all us, not only for Romania, for all us, for all Balkanic area, in the, in the direction um, to have the possibility to export more easily all over the world, starting from there. Uh, and we are involved in this, uh, in this uh, new project. We try to help the two countries, Macedonia and Albania, <coughs> to create it his um, uh, gaze distribution. It's, we are very good, uh, very good skills in this, in this direction, one, more than 100 years. They are news. Okay, we can help it to, to that is some of, some of steps when we are making together. Of course, we are starting to, to discuss with ASEAN, to create it, to work from ASEAN like a, like a European market, to open the gate from the European market and for through us to to go in Asia to export there mm -hmm. like a, like an other opportunity again not against China another opportunity from Asia yeah. because it's well, more it's better like that we have we have more more idea to how to do and how to to const to build together in uh, in the same direction. And more than that, more, more than that are the integration from Albania and Macedonia in the European market. Because they are, they are already comes from the structures NATO, welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, now we, are, we have the possibility to, to, uh, to create the uh, deepest uh, um, relationship between the, all this, this uh, country. And in my opinion, we must be glad Maybe we are not 12. We'll be 15, 14, 15 in the next one, two, three years. All right. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Rogozinaro. Um, other question, please. Yes. Wants to answer. In fact, given that countries reacted to the economic effects of the pandemic, first at national level, how much momentum do you think is there left still for regional cooperation format? Are the next steps still feasible at the commitments of the countries in the region reliable? And also in that context, we know some of the people return in their countries and uh, could be a risk for the economics, for a burden for the state, or it's opportunity for the economic uh, environment. Right. Um, I'm connected to your question before. Yes. Yeah, a little bit. Way yeah. I, I don't know. We should answer again. Or uh, <laughs> you want to take the may, Maybe we have uh, someone else who want to answer. Uh, yes, uh, I hope uh, she is still with us. Yes. Boromisa, the question is for it was for you. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, so I think the question the development go in both ways and it's uh, in question how do governments manage the situation and how do they uh, try to form and uh, public opinion and how do they strategically co communicate uh, one of the obvious uh, results is that the covid and inward oriented solution is disrupted uh, uh, trade channels and value chains and it, it led to not optimal solutions. So this is one of the reasons to reinforce and to uh, look uh, not only uh, inward but also in, within the region and globally. But of course there is a challenge that uh, this opportunity will be missed and that uh, the governments and people will 
see other people and other different different cultures, different productions as a threat, and that in in this direction that it, it will uh, I think the recovery will, will be slower, more, more painful, and uh, the consequences will be deeper and more difficult to face. So I think there is, of course, that there is always a scope for cooperation and that, uh, by definition, more people are likely to get the better solutions. So, but the challenge is how to cooperate, how to harmonize and how to identify the best solution, how to share the information and to ensure that uh, this will sound like really very EU based bureaucratic uh, jargon, but that really no one is left behind. So that in inclusive approach uh, and considering those who might be losers in the process is the key for getting the support for regional solutions that, which might be faster and better than internal inward looking and uh, designed for small communities. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, okay, I have a questions uh, for the Alexander uh, and uh, for Mr. Stanku in my quality like uh, rector of the uh, one of uh, biggest university in the west part of Romania. <laughs> in the context of the new work environment that you have described, uh, Alexander, what new competence do you consider that university should provide to the students to enhance their chances of employment? A good question, because uh, as I was describing before, a lot of competences are changing now. I mean, first of all, data is becoming more and more important. So uh, we, we need to understand how to uh, access data, how to uh, uh, administrate it, and how to interpret it. So this, this kind of process is becoming important. As such, the collaboration between industry and the university becomes more and more important because I, as an industry, can provide the, the platform, the, the environment uh, for the university to access to this kind of uh, information and give a chance to learn uh, the industrial requirements. At the same time, uh, you know, my, my people get access to uh, university uh, uh, requirements and, and, the and influencing the curriculum. Right. Uh, secondly, is also about uh, the change of culture, uh, we, what we're going through. So uh, it becomes not only a question only of, of hard skills, but also about soft skills, how people will approach the type of job in the future, how they will uh, work in a, in, a, in a changed environment. And as such, I think, uh, as, a, as a close collaboration, we are having already and we are developing uh, together. Uh, this is uh, basically the platform what we should uh, develop. Uh, and these are the skills what will be more and more needed in the future. Right. Yes, and, uh, I would, uh, thank you. And I would also like to add, uh, so I think the best approach here is uh, an invitation to dialogue to see exactly uh, what information we can exchange because from our perspective the technical is rather niched so we are in collaboration with the vendors that produce the, the IT equipment that we use and sell to our customer to get the knowledge as well. But also, and uh, thank you for mentioning, soft skills are very important. So so looking at the, the current engineers and then the next generation of engineers self-learning, learning fast and not necessarily learning legacy like um, it doesn't, a person doesn't need to know at the atom level how it works, but with all the platform, the cloud platform, the, the AI behind, we also need a macro approach of learning because there are a lot of tools out there. There are a lot of machines that are uh, doing the job for us. We need to learn how to work with them. So to answer short, um, new competence related to the latest products and self-learning and fast learning. This is what we need as an industry. I uh, receive uh, on the chat uh, one question from uh, one person who are in the uh, auditorium for uh, Mr. Adam Eberhardt. At the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, the world faced the downside of globalization supply chains disrupt, over-released 
on the manufacturing in China, do you think the Balkans could potentially represent a convenient space for the relocated of huge international companies? Yes, well, thank you, Mr. So uh, if I may, I will. Uh, may I? Okay. So if I if I may, well, I, I will I will start with the first question about uh, migration and and people who have moved to the West and are returning today because of economic crisis. Uh, certainly, in, in a short run, in a short term, it is a problem for countries which are heavily dependent on remittances. But what I believe is the most important problem for them is people, uh, pe people exodus. It is people uh, emigrating from those countries. And uh, in a long run, I believe uh, we will see an increase of out, uh, outflow of people from the Balkans to, to, to Western Europe. And it is really a, a challenge. Regarding uh, the locations, Yes, you know, from, from theoret theoretically speaking, indeed, there is an opportunity. The opportunity that with a demise of globalization, we, some huge European companies would uh, support relocation and would uh, seek new, uh, new destinations for their companies to relocate from, uh, from, from China. The question is whether it will be Balkans or they will find some other destinations in Southeast Asia, for instance, in countries of South Asia, India, India Bangladesh. I, personally, I, 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 I fear that our regions are not competitive enough in order to get a huge inflow of, uh, of, of capital uh, in case of uh, uh, relocation. So, so I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I, don't, I, I don't think that our bubble, regional bubble, could, uh, could, uh, could strongly benefit from, from such relocations, but, 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 but let, 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 let us try. Very much. Very much. Very much. Very much. Mr. Rogojnaru, if you um, have the answer. Yes, a couple, couple words. First of all, I'm not agreed much with what uh, Mr. Adams said. Uh, for us, for the Balkan, it's a big opportunity now. What I say that? Because a lot of uh, German company, uh, French company, look at very much to relocate it from China. Right. Uh, for example, us, Romania, but I'm speaking also with some other countries from Balkans, from that I, I say the Balkans, we are opening to receive all this new, new or old industry who want to be relocated nearly from at home. Of course, maybe we are not so, so good luck, uh, I don't know, the Asian country. Maybe we are more expensive than the others, but if we make uh, some calculus from long terms, and see what it means to have transport, 11,000 kilometers against 2,000 kilometers. Things, for example, what it means for Österreich, a company who relocated to, to China in, uh, in ASEAN, or relocated here, 100 kilometers, 1,000 kilometers, sorry. It's, uh, it's nothing. In five years only, in the, in the transport costs, they cover the, what the, what's mean uh, the transfer cost. From that I say, it's very important for us from the Balkanic area to play these cards, to play these cards about a relocated company. And I, we are speaking already with the Chamber of Commerce of uh, Germany, with RHK. We are speaking with the Austrian Chamber of Commerce. We are speaking with the CSIF, with the France, uh, British, uh, British Chamber. Uh, I'm champ with all this, all this, uh, all this uh, chamber of commerce to give the possibility to to give the to present to his membership the possibility to relocate it here nearly than Europe. Thank you. Well, we see already the trends coming back. We see it already actually because sort of the threats what we've seen in the 
in, in, in coming from Asia, basically, a lot of companies uh, will have been rethinking and, and moving business already back now into, into let's say, East Europe, huh? that's, the Balkan that's area. The story. And I think uh, you mentioned and pointed that out, you have to always see the landed cost. And uh, if you calculate it through, at the end of the day, labor costs are also increasing in Asia. Uh, so, uh, labor costs will be in five years or maybe less than five years, also in Asia will be like yes, here. Yes. Okay, yeah. we grow it more. It's, it's normal. But if I take uh, only this in the calculus, only the, this, the, 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 the difference between the transport, and mm -hmm. I have, uh, I don't speak more than what's mean stability. I don't, yeah, I don't the, speak about mm -hmm. all these other good things that I have because I'm NATO. <laughs> you know? But the trade sector is there, and you see like the interruption of, uh, of, of, course, of supply chain now, what we had uh, through this current pandemic. So I think a lot of companies are rethinking the position, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. You, you, you spoke by the Minister of uh, Economy or by uh, uh, Business uh, <laughs> Environment? <laughs> 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 maybe, maybe both. Both, maybe <laughs> both yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Uh, it was very interesting presentation, very interesting discussion. Uh, uh, we, we are all in the economic panel, and everybody knows uh, the time is money. Uh, <laughs> our uh, time is uh, uh, expire, and uh, this can be the moment uh, to conclude. But uh, you know what it said: uh, to draw a conclusion is. Uh, us uh, if you are tired to think more about that subject. We, I'm pretty sure everyone, uh, we have uh, more to think about uh, uh, this subject and uh, that's why uh, we can uh, conclude uh, here uh, uh, all the discussion. Thank you very much for everyone. Uh, now we have a coffee break and uh, we will uh, be here and log uh, on the platform at uh, 4.50 uh, uh, in the afternoon. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.
friends, dear students, honorary audience, uh, we are here for the last uh, panel of the conference Security Challenges in the Balkans, the fourth edition. The panel is entitled Hybrid Warfare in the Balkans, Infodemics and Not Only. And it is my pleasure to invite uh, Mrs. Alina Borgovanu, Senior Associate Expert, New Strategy Center, Dean, Faculty of Communication and Pol Public Relation, National School of Political Science and Public Administration from Romania to please uh, uh, tell us a few words on this topic. Hello. Can I start? Hi, hello everybody. Uh, thank you for this introduction and thank you for inviting me to part to be part of this panel. Uh, I just want to make sure that you can hear me. Okay. I also have a presentation, so I will kindly ask the colleagues from New Strategy Center to start running it if it is if it is possible. Uh, so my presentation is about the uh, COVID-19 infodemic in Romania, and uh, so I will. Uh, I have chosen Romania as a case study, uh, but the basic premise of my presentation is that uh, there is a global infodemic that is strikingly similar across the entire globe, or it is transnationally similar. So my expectation is that um, uh, presenting some of the toxic narratives that circulated in Romania will provide the background for seeing whether this, uh, these same narratives circulated in other countries, including countries from the Balkan areas. Uh, is, is the presentation on? Because I do not see it on my computer. Okay, that's fine. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so first of all, uh, I will uh, I will draw the at attention to the fact that the infodemic has been defined by the World Health Organization as a problem of over overabundance of information. So what is uh, striking, what is new about the current infodemic compared, compared to other periods is that uh, it is created by too much information. It is not created by uh, restricted access to information, by too little information, but on the contrary, it is, co it is created in a context where information is pretty much everywhere and it is abundant. So in as early as February, uh, World, Health, the World, World Health Organization defined the infodemic as an overabundance of information, some of, some of it correct, some of it misleading, that uh, prevents people from having access to trustworthy information. Uh, so why this is important? Because infodemic, meaning this mix of over overabundance of information uh, can uh, lead people not to comply with the measures that were put in place by the authorities. 
and can increase mistrust. So infodemic is not a theoretical problem, but it has an impact on the people's willingness to comply with the rules. And also it, uh, it impacts uh, uh, their trust in authorities and also in one another. Another effect, another thing that I should mention about infodemic is that it may be used by hostile states in their campaigns. So infodemic is not directly related to information war, but it is def it has definitely has something to do with it. So my my understanding is that not all these narratives are driven by state actors, but they are part. They can be instrumentalized in uh, uh, disinformation campaigns. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you very much. So, as I have mentioned, this information is a global problem. Uh, according to my analysis, that has started right at that has started right at the beginning of, of the beginning of the pandemic. There are some dominant narratives, narratives that circulated all over the globe. According to my research, some of these uh, dominant narratives are what you see on the slides. The fact that the virus was man-made, was fabricated in a laboratory. Another, another widely circulated narrative is that the pandemic is just a pretext to impose mandatory mass vaccination. Another uh, global uh, toxic nar narrative is that there are fake remedies to the COVID infection, but these are hidden the, by the authorities and by the big pharma. Another uh, toxic narrative that the pandemic, pandemic is actually a pandemic. I mean, there is a plan, there is a hidden plan, and it is used as a pretext in order to impose all kinds of agendas. And another toxic narrative that was widely circulated um, in uh, various parts of the world is that the 5G network contributes to spreading the, the virus. So again, this is my uh, research about the global, the toxic narratives that circulated all over the world. Uh, next slide. Uh, on the next slides, you have uh, some sources in which these global narratives were documented. Uh, this information is a transnational problem. So there are various reports that widely document uh, documents these narratives. You see here a vast reports, reports by uh, fact checkers, by AFP and uh, stuff like that. So I have put here some of the reports that were here and also on the on the next slide I have put some uh, slide, some uh, uh, references to this uh, report. Uh, if we go to the next slide, the next slide has al also has some of these uh, reports that were done by international fact checkers that document documented these toxic narratives. Um, Mm, so we, that was the general background, and I will illustrate some of these narratives with their manif manifestations in Romania. So if we go to the next slide, the, the next slide, I have chosen uh, um, some uh, captions from the Romanian online environment. Uh, about uh, this uh, topic. So, so you, you, you see here an illustration of the first narrative that the virus was man-made. Uh, this is a document, sorry, so probably people from other countries will recognize this English-speaking documentary that circulated also in Romania and that was translated in Romania, so with subtitles, with uh, good translations. Um, claiming that the virus was created in a laboratory in order to impose all kinds of agendas. Um, if we go to the next slide, again, this is an illustration of this man-made um, theory, man-made conspiracy. So can we go to the next slide? What I wanted to underline uh, you see here that the visualization of these posts is very, very powerful. These are not uh, neutral uh, images, but uh, they, are, uh, they try to demonize the subject, to connect it to, to create a lot of anxiety about this. 
about the location of the laboratory of the laboratory where uh, the vir virus originated. There were different different sources, but that circulated in Romania, such as uh, uh, Wuhan laboratory, then uh, laboratory in the United States. And after that, there are all kind of all kind of uh, improvements. Let's say of these theories, uh, Israel was considered as a source of uh, the of the lab of the laboratory, or anyway a secret a secret laboratory. So again, uh, uh, this was one that was one of the most uh, widely circulated uh, narrative in the Romanian uh, di digital ecosystem. Again, the location of the secret laboratory being very, very, very. Uh, that was a powerful narrative that circulated mostly at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, the next uh, slide con uh, in contains some illustrations about the so-called remedies, uh, natural remedies, uh, miracle remedies. So I do not have a problem with this kind of remedies. Uh, the problem is that they were presented as miracle cures. So the twist related to the presentation of these uh, remedies was that they are hidden by the big pharma. pharma. So uh, they are not made available to the public in order to impose all kinds of ideas. So it is not their presentation as such as a complementary means to boost uh, immunity, for example, but the, their toxicity derives from the fact that they were considered as miracle remedies and people were widely encouraged to use them instead to go to hospitals, for example. Uh, the next slide is also illustrative of this uh, kind of narrative about um, fake remedies uh, such as vitamin C, vitamin D, um, salt water, lukewarm water, um, garlic as being a natural vaccine that again is very cheap, but, but that is hidden by the big pharmas. And the, the next slide is dedicated to this final, to this uh, topic that garlic is a miracle uh, remedy uh, for curing the COVID inf infection. So again, uh, I'm not saying that these are not uh, good uh, things to do while you are sick, but the problem is that in this kind of conspiratorial thinking, these cures were presented as the only cures, and again, they were presented as being deliberately hidden by, of, by the authorities in order to, to make people sick. So it is more the twist regarding this presentation. If we Professor Bergamano, I'm very sorry to interrupt, but I'll try to ask you, please conclude in a, in a minute. Because the last, uh, uh, the last, uh, the second part of our panel will be dedicated to questions, uh, debates, and and so on. Thank you. On the on the other slides, there are illustration of the of other two toxic narratives. One about the the Bill Gates uh, conspiracy that there is a worldwide the next one. There is a wide, world, world, worldwide conspiracy in order to impose vaccination. And uh, the final one is that coronavirus is a pandemic. So the, the documentary that circulated in the American space also circulated in Romania. And what is important, and I will conclude here, is that after it was banned from the digital platforms, it managed to, to keep on circulating in the Romanian public space under, under different names, under translations. So simply banning this kind of videos from the platform was not a successful strategy in Romania, at least. And I will, uh, if there are questions, I, will, I, I could give more example and explanations about this topic. Thank you very much. Mrs. Bergawano, the questions will be addressed in the uh, second half of our uh, of our panel. Uh, we move on now uh, to Mrs. Jelena Milic, Director, Center for Euro-Atlantic Studies, Serbia. Please, Mrs. Milic, we are eager to hear your communication.
Hi, everyone. Hello from Belgrade. Do you hear me? Hello? Hello. Hello, Hello. 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 Ms. Milic, we can hear you, so please go on with your communication. Everything is fine. Okay, I only got the sound right now. Uh, hello to everyone from Belgrade. It was really uh, very useful um, listening to uh, previous panel speakers. Got uh, this picture of what's going on uh, uh, in Balkans in terms of where Balkans is uh, on the map and what are the political vectors uh, um, going around these days. Um, so I have decided to address the um, other part of the title of this panel, uh, not only, and to uh, provide a few additional uh, pixels to the picture from the down bottom up perspective that may add up to the clarity of what's going on here. Uh, I will actually remind us all on some uh, recent developments, uh, but maybe when we put them together and when we analyze them together, we can get a slightly different picture. And then maybe uh, um, we can you know, uh, consider changes in front also uh, a new hybrid threats and infodemics that we are facing. Uh, so um, the last several years in Serbia have been uh, matched with the uh, 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 um, increasing interest both by Serbian government and by uh, uh, U.S. government to stop U.S. perception of Serbia, uh, of United States in the region. And it works like charm. I don't know how the slides are, are, are moved uh, up and down here on your screen. Uh, anyway, um, Serbians are responding very well to slightly different approach. Uh, this admin. Uh, mainly in, in manner uh, in which they address us and um, uh, in fact that they do not acknowledge that it is 2020, not late 90s anymore, and that we are not a world pariah as we once were. Um, so uh, it has always been easy to address uh, uh, economic operation as something less painful, etc. But um, new dynamic uh, says that even 65% of Serbians uh, uh, in favor of closer cooperation with the United States in economy, security, and defense. This is really a new, very good trend, which should not be thrown away with the Christian uh, water. So, uh, in the last several years, Serbia has also shown a strong commitment to stronger um, uh, regional cooperation. Uh, and all of these elements that are piling up are uh, leveling the field uh, for the entire Western Balkans and Southeast Europe uh, for partners to, to um, respond together to some of the ongoing hybrid threats and challenges. Uh, so Serbia became a center of the uh, transport community, which is intergovernmental organization. Uh, um, the EU and Western Balkan 6 in order to region, level the field and catch up with the uh, uh, trans-European networks policies, in particular in infrastructure. It's in charge for road, rail and river uh, 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 transportation. And I think that Serbians are not following a lot uh, what's going on with the transfer and and crisis mobility out time to learn about the initiative was very well um, presented in Serbia public and I think uh, it has a lot of potential in particular now with the arrival of new uh, agency uh, to the region. One of the DFC, I will speak about it later. One of the key events of this year and I uh, slightly surprised that I haven't heard the references about it uh, um, from the previous speakers 
was uh, September, um, we call it Washington agreements between Serbia and United States and between Kosovo and United States. Uh, very good agreement. Uh, there is nothing in it that uh, the new administration, in case if Mr. Vice President Biden wins, should not uh, continue implementing. Uh, I'm also surprised how lukewarm uh, recipient uh, uh, EU gave to this uh, outcome, um, almost dismissive. Some uh, comments were along the lines, yes, but uh, it's only what the EU has been already doing in the region through the Berlin process, for example, but it's not true. First of all, the uh, Berlin process was uh, um, hitting the wall uh, because of the Kosovo tariffs. We had limited success in setting up a youth office, uh, flattering uh, uh, roaming rates, etc. But there are new, new significant elements, and in the view of uh, recent unpleasant, uh, tragic uh, events in Europe, they are becoming even more relevant. One of them, the least commented element of Serbia-US agreement is that both parties, meaning Belgrade and Pristina, will increase airline passenger screening information sharing between each other and within the framework of the broader U.S. cooperation in Balkans and commit to technology upgrades to combat illicit activities by implementing and operationalizing U.S. provided screening and information systems, including, and then there are a bunch of uh, acronyms, but it is for the first time that uh, we hear there is a mechanism for Serbia and Kosovo to exchange data among themselves and then to share it with the US. It's a great progress, if you ask me. Designation of Hezbollah as a terrorist organization, improvement of both parties' relationship with Israel is also relevant. And I think that uh, even recognition of Kosovo severely undermine um, ongoing trend of um, improvement of Serbia-Israel relationship as well. Uh, to go on, uh, one of the results um, of this agreement is a um, setup of the U.S. government uh, uh, agency, uh, International Development Finance, who is, uh, which is in charge support investments uh, in the region by providing additional guarantees in the areas around the world uh, where the U.S. has strategic interest and Serbia and the, is designated to be the center again of this office. Uh, and it's good news because uh, the office works a lot. For example, Napoli uh, um, uh, port, I think that uh, they are looking for investments in El Sefina port, which is 11 kilometers from Piraeus uh, near to Athens. Well, right after we uh, reached this agreement, uh, which is definitely the direction, uh, uh, were not uh, calm. And uh, we got an announcement, notice, so to say, by the Russian output Sputnik in Serbia that Russia is intending to open its uh, um, Ministry of Defense office in the Serbian Ministry of Defense. Defense. I think remind you, please, it's not Russian, very, very strong pressure to uh, grant diplomatic status to so called um, Serbia Russia diplomat, uh, cent humanitarian center in Nish. On the contrary, uh, because Serbia actually government over to all the control of the city of Nish. The humanitarian center which moved its premises at the uh, airport building would uh, actually try to gain access to the airport. So uh, what we actually see is not a final agreement. This is what the Russian minister, prime minister, sorry, gave as a green light to Russian Ministry of Defense to negotiate with Serbia. We still haven't heard from Serbian authorities. There is one very uh, threatening and unpleasant element in this agreement. If it goes through, this, this is what Russia intends. That, is that uh, they are military technical, as Ben would say, peacekeepers, military technical experts with access to a Serbian military facility without any uh, restraints, uh, um, only uh, they only. Uh, Ms. Milic, I'm uh, sorry to intervene, but please try to 
conclude in one minute. We also have a bit of a technical problem here. Thank you. New government composition is a clear uh, 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 sign that Serbia is actually willing to to continue to uh, reapproach United States and to decouple from Russia. But we can do it on our own. We have a lot of problems, and we need a lot of assistance and more flexible approach. The new Minister of Defense has less inflammatory rhetoric towards the region, which is very good. He was a Minister of Interior, and his units were exercising video. Navy skills, and from what I gather, he is a uh, 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 welcome uh, uh, a change in the Serbian, uh, generally more pro US government. So, uh, Serbia has tied a lot of its uh, eggs to Mr. Trump's administration, I think, with a good reason. The outcome of this approach is that we have more relaxed atmosphere here, uh, that we are more perceptive to co cooperate. States shall publish our new poll um, trying to measure the effect of the recent Washington agreement, and we will publish it next week. So my recommendation would be that uh, regardless of who is in a, in a, uh, office uh, in White House, uh, they continue with the current approach, which is slightly more flexible and. Uh, during the 90s, when Mr. Biden in the region professionally and emotionally, and in particular during Obama's administration, where the US focus was elsewhere, not here in the Balkans. And there is a recommendation for the EU as well. We usually hear from the US, such as the United States, that the US and the EU cooperate and work together. Well, you know, this uh, premise can be turned around. A message that the EU should get, bearing in mind the boosts, you know, in the dialogue between Belgrade, Pristina, and overall developments in the positive uh, developments in the region, which are uh, uh, most usually falling under everybody's radar. Thank you. It's a solid and interesting uh, uh, presentation. And uh, we move on to Mrs. Antonia Kolibashanu, analyst, Geopolitical Futures, Romania. Ms. Kolibashanu, the floor is yours, but please try not to uh, uh, speak more than seven or eight minutes, okay? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for having me, first of all. And uh, what if I speak, speak less? Am I going to be punished for that or not? I can actually have um, have a, a slower, smaller speech because I don't have a PowerPoint. However, I hope that uh, the sound is okay. I do expect some feedback. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so basically, um, I am going to be rather short in saying that I'm not an expert on infodemics, but I am an analyst on geopolitics, and therefore I have to understand a bit of infodemics um, and uh, all that has been very much in fashion about hybrid warfare and uh, the half truths uh, that are um, laying uh, out the floor for geopolitics in the region. Therefore, um, my first um, element to comment on would be um, the perception, the perception of what is half truths, of what is expected uh, and what is a uh, working uh, subject for the so-called infodemics. Uh, and that for uh, the geopolitical aspects uh, have been uh, two main um, issues. First of all, um, on the political and the very geopolitical front, uh, we have the perception of a U.S. withdrawal uh, which is rather false, but however, we have seen um, a lot of uh, analysis and a lot of uh, speeches pointing to the fact that the U.S. will withdraw from Europe uh, to pivot away either to Asia or to pivot to its internal problems. While it is true that the U.S. will uh, have to deal with its internal problems, it is also true that the new containment line 
is rather close to the Balkans in particular, on eastern front, eastern flank of NATO, and lies between the Baltic and the Black Sea. Um, therefore, obviously, um, this perception or this half-truth, um, it is half-true because obviously um, the U.S. has to deal with its internal problems, as I uh, have said, while being engaged in the strategic point. Um, this points to a power competition that is perceived to be more urgent now in the region. And that power competition is between Russia, Turkey, the EU, Germany, and uh, France as uh, the proponents of the EU and EU interests in the region. But not only, uh, China also, even if China as well has to deal with, uh, with its internal problems and its uh, near abroad. Uh, so basically, uh, the infodemic, so to call in, uh, in geopolitical terms, have to do with more competition and pot potentially more aggressiveness when it comes to major players in the region. Now, the second element um, that uh, has to do with uh, geopolitics and, again, comes from the realm of infodemics, refers uh, to um, the economic wellness or the not wellness, the perception of a recession coming soon or, or even um, more urgent, um, the perception of a depression coming soon in the world and in Europe in particular, which will likely affect the Balkans and Eastern Europe uh, in a more dramatic way than our uh, can, and than what we have seen uh, to be the effects of the economic crisis in 2008-2010. So that um, is to be decided by how well the economics uh, will prove um, that scenario to be correct. And obviously, we will see that in the numbers. Um, and to be honest, I have seen some recent numbers. They are not very much optimistic. But as an economist, um, as uh, the first job, I would also say that we have to wait a bit to see whether we are talking about recessions or depressions and what kind of recession and where, what kind of sectors have yet to be hit and, uh, hit and how. So, meanwhile, while uh, the analysts um, need more details, um, the infodemics is uh, pushing towards increasing polarization. And that fact uh, of increasing polarization, meaning the differences between social classes, the differences between countries, the developed, uh, emerging, or underdeveloped countries, uh, the differences between the urban and the rural uh, areas are going to become wider and not uh, be um, less um, differences. So obviously, while the gap is still there and very much important, we are going to have to deal with security problems, something that um, we have actually recently seen in Europe, um, meaning polarization is leading to areas of the urban um, centers uh, no longer uh, being able to be managed well, we are unsure of the risks in um, these areas, and we are also unsure of the risks laying in uh, the differences between the rural and the, the urban and those between classes. Um, that, I would say, is probably the highest risk for Europe and one of the highest risks for the Balkans in particular because here we are dealing uh, not only with economic problems um, potentially arising due to the pandemic, but not only, but also with a highly um, aggressive competition between the major power, which lay the ground for more infodemics and in turn uh, lay the ground for uh, more tension between classes while the economic uh, differences are high. 
So I would point out um, to the opportunity for us catching up on solving the matters, uh, to the opportunity of us in the Balkans knowing what um, what lays in in um, in the region in terms of what happens in the urban in the problematic urban areas. We know better than, for instance. Uh, um, a country like France or even Germany, uh, what happens in the problematic urban areas. But um, it is still a need for us to catch up fast with the increasing risk of polarization causing higher security risks for us too. Um, so that is my very short presentation. I welcome um, any questions or comments uh, at the very end of the session? And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kolobashano, for this interesting uh, presentation. And we move on to Mr. Greg Melker, Chief Operations Service, Center for the Study of New Generation Warfare, USA. Mr. Melker, please, no more than seven minutes. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks for the opportunity to participate, and uh, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in Timisoara. I think that's my favorite city so far in Romania. Maybe when, when the virus is gone, I can get back there and go to the Opera House. Uh, okay, so I, I focused on the, the part of the title where it says, and not only, so I'm not going to talk about inf infodemics at all. So I'm going to hit three points. One is my view of how NATO should be more aggressive in hybrid warfare, using a Montenegro example. Uh, second, uh, something I pulled out of the recent uh, uh, military mobility workshop, and a last point on how China conducts what I consider a different type of, of uh, hybrid warfare on the Balkans. Okay, so let's first talk about the uh, uh, U.S. and NATO. So as I understand it, as we speak, there's an elite U.S. cyber team and a NATO specialized counter-hybrid support team that have been deployed uh, to Montenegro to address Russian meddling there and reflects the concern by NATO and the U.S. military commanders of the increased security risk in the Western Balkans. With the Montenegro elections set for next year and with the experience of the 2016 coup attempt, all efforts should be made to prevent major, major hybrid inf intervention again. And I'm sure that hybrid actions are already well on our way there in attempting to influence the uh, the, pop, the political opposition and soured the disposition of the general population against NATO in the West. <clears throat> Excuse me. I bring this up to make the point that I don't think NATO will survive if it holds the same standards toward hybrid activities as it does towards an overt kinetic attack or invasion. For hybrid actions, we just can't wait to be on the defense and only retaliate after being attacked. Uh, Russians believe information warfare is the new form of warfare, and, and they can get their way with that. There's no reason that they need to escalate to tanks, guns, and missiles. Therefore, NATO can't, in these fragile situations, simply wait around to react. They must, as just started in Montenegro, move quickly to both defend and quickly and publicly identify the perpetrators, <clears throat> as, for example, we've seen recently in uh, the outrages expressed by Germany and the Czech Republic about Russian uh, hybrid activities. Uh, it's high time to think of not just retaliatory attacks in the hybrid or cyber sphere, but perhaps prevented offensive actions for actors that are repeat offenders. For example, President Trump admitted that the U.S. conducted a covert cyber attack against the Russian Internet Research Agency in 2018 and in 2019 into the Russian electric power grid. Foreign adversaries such as Russia need to know that the agencies and units engaged in hybrid activities can be held at risk. I do see NATO taking their gloves off here as ultimately a form of deterrence. It could lead to escalation, but so far little price has been paid for the Russian bad activities. Uh, so that's the first thing, and I think uh, I think the sowing of confusion in NATO and EO countries has to come to an end, and, and it's not going to come to an end unless more aggressive action is taken. Uh, uh, so next topic, uh, uh, be mindful of my time here. I just completed some research and workshops for an effort led by uh, General Ben Hodges and, and SEPA that looked at military mobility. I was the leader of the Western Balkans Working Group, one of five different scenarios that were considered by this initiative. I had a pretty amazing team of NATO and EO, EU experts on the working group, and I thought I'd pull something out of interesting out of that. Now, this was absolutely not a comprehensive look at hybrid warfare ever, so I'm just picking one I thought that was a, that, that I particularly enjoyed learning a little bit more about. And this comes to uh, the issue of uh, undersea data cables. I understand that there are three main communication cables that feed the Western Balkan region. I don't know what percentage of data used in the Balkans that are carried on these specific ca cables. But the estimates are that 90% of all data and internet communications between the US and NATO are carried by transatlantic cables. So I suspect it's probably a fair amount. 
Uh, you know, the data may leave your computer on Wi-Fi, but the bulk of the other communication is going to end up on these fiber optic cables. And probably it's whatever I'm saying now is going through these same, same cables. Uh, this is a vulnerable area of hybrid attack, which could be both cyber or physical, both at the undersea location and at the land termination locations. Further, as these types of cables, um, once they get out of the water, also tend to run along the road right of ways. So they're easily found and can be tapped into covertly through their exploit, disinformation, or just general disruption of a network. Concern of this vulnerability was a recent topic of a NATO military leadership who warned that Russia has been aggressively probing undersea communication cable networks and that Russian submarines could potentially covertly cut or tap into them. This has become important enough that it was a topic of conversation by the NATO defense ministers as recently as 22 October. They're thinking that attacks of this kind be part of a hybrid warfare mixing both open and covert acts of war. Uh, last on this topic, a few years ago, there were some incidents where Russia tried to interfere with the laying of undersea power cables between Sweden and Lithuania. This was both intimidation of the crews attempting to lay the cable and disruptions once the cable was in place. Just so we all know that the Russia already has a track record of active engagement in this type of hybrid warfare. Okay, and uh, last topic um, is I'd like to talk a little bit about China. And when I see them exercising influence operations of a very different form, but what I still consider to be hybrid warfare. And I have to give some credit here to uh, the Center for uh, CSI, Center for Strategic and International Studies that did an interesting report on Serbia influence with China as well as uh, Oscar Johnson from the Swedish Defense University. And I used some of their publications to put this together. Anyway, to summarize all that now, just in a paragraph, here we see in Serbia that China provides large investments into infrastructure development, especially transportation, energy, and digital sectors, which in turn leads to Serbia, Serbia's public support of China's foreign policy objectives, such as the one China policy, or, or in other ways, just a lack of criticism of human rights issues, such as the Uyghurs. Further, these investments were promoted as public and the public as gifts, when in reality they're loans, which are sourced of a source of increased debt burden on the country. The facts on the ground are the EU is by far the greatest contributor of foreign aid to Serbia, but their motion by and of China misleads the public there to believe that China is the largest source of assistance when it's actually well below the EU. Uh, by the way, this misleading of the public is also true as a result of Russian disinformation and strategic communications and its promotion that of Sputnik, Serbia, and other pro clement organizations there. In this case, polls have shown that a high percentage of Serbs see NATO as a threat and think Russia is their most supportive military partner. Uh, yet some data I found here said that Serbian military cooperation is actually significantly closer to NATO than with Russia. And that's a little out of date. Maybe things have changed in the last couple of years. But in 2016, for example, they documented 125 different military military exchanges between the Serbian military and, and the NATO, uh, NATO military. Yet there were only four in that year with Russia. Uh, and the same is true of Russian investment being less than the EU. Yet the public perception is, that, is the opposite due to the disinformation that's put out. But anyway, so back on China, just one other piece. You know, there are other areas of a concern in Serbia, uh, you know, relating to ICT or 5G, but I thought one to highlight is the setting of technical standards. China, with their Belt and Road initiatives, is, is attempting to establish their own different technical standards from that of the West. Uh, again, here in Serbia, in return for the assistant investments, they've been pushing Serbia to drop the Chinese, the Chinese standards. And this will have very grave consequences for Syria and their ability to integrate in any way into the EU uh, will be much more challenging if they go down this path and adopt the Chinese approach. So I see I've hit my seven minutes, so I'll stop right there. Thank you. For this very uh, dense and firm presentation, thank you very much. And we move on to Mr. Uh, Murat Aslan, faculty member, Hassan Kalyonku University. Mr. Aslan, the floor is yours for seven minutes precisely. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will cut it short, though. I, I, I want to just uh, first present what I will present and the question I will answer. The question I want to answer in an academic way is, if pandemic uh, lowered the threats and risks in the frame of hybrid warfare, and my argument is that it has become a multiplier and offered opportunities to actors party to hybrid warfare. And for this uh, purpose, I will go through the nature uh, of the hybrid warfare status in Balkans, uh, apart from methodology and means of it, and I will conclude afterwards. Uh, if first, let, let's uh, agree on what hybrid warfare is. Okay, if you go through the articles on hybrid warfare, 
for instance, Robert Johnson. His article indicates five different fields. Politics, diplomacy, varying degrees of military, media and economy as sub elements of this warfare. On the other hand, if you go and search the definition of Frank Hoffman, who identified and claimed this term, it's unconventional and conventional exploitation of means. Uh, and it includes asymmetry, for instance. And as you know, as you know, it also indicates the united exploitation of all, all means other than military for uh, Frank Hoffman. Well, why? Then the question is why? First of all, the concerns of the modern warfare, especially in the Western Hemisphere. The cost is very high in terms of human, human suffrage, uh, financial burden, and also it has long-term effects, as you know. And maximum gains are always desired by the actors, mainly state actors, with efficient means. So now here we go. Uh, we have hybrid warfare. On the other hand, the solutions are usually claimed as indirect method of warfare, especially for the last two decades, by soft means and without any accountability of the state actors. For instance, if you go to Libya, now we have Wagner Co uh, Corporation of Russia, and Russia claims that they are not Russian soldiers and no accountability for Russians. Okay. And if you apply the same scenario to the other uh, regions, you will see the same thing. On the other hand, there's an, another reality that we should understand. It's about actors in the modern warfare. We know that now we have a multi-actoral and multi-factoral conflictual environment that exploits asymmetry, proxy, and hybrid warfare. That means starting from individual to the uh, level of supra-state formations, and including societal groups, everybody is in a warfare in case there's a kind of common disagreement, either between the communities, like religions, like ethnicities, or the states. So it brings us a new type of uh, classification, actually. It is actually uh, in the limits of the new and uh, a bit challenging uh, security conceptualization, widening and deepening security in terms of terms and also the unit of analysis. At the meantime, at the meantime, technology is important. Now we include everybody to the ongoing efforts. Now everybody is re uh, increasingly and spontaneously drafting a message by means of Twitter and delivering it. So. What does that mean? Environment of conflicts. In case there's a hybrid warfare, it's really complicated. Everybody's a party to any problem field in question. On the other hand, we have mutual relations of the state and non-state actors and societies and individuals. They are intertwined. Now, states are cooperating with terror organizations. States are cooperating with non-state actors and states do not perceive themselves as responsible to address any problem if their interests are not part of it. And in this case, there's a gap between the desired security environment and the actual realities on the ground in terms of establishing a secure one. So then what we will see is criminal organizations, terrorist organizations, extremism or radicalism. So there is a challenging to state and also states are challenging environment uh, at both levels of the studies, researches. So for this purpose, I just wanted to focus on Balkans uh, under the realities of this uh, determ determinations. In Balkans, if you go through the overall region, we have extreme right, extreme left, radicals of all ideological segments. We have organized criminal gangs in maybe in all Balkan region. And we have, especially after, after the Syria case, lone wolves, not only in the Western Europe, but also in Balkans. 
We have also states challenging each other with a covered competition and imagine more. And right after uh, this pandemic uh, process, pandemic, uh, there was no lower level of competition or existence of these uh, organizations, entities, or criminals or radicals. It increased because there was no means to prevent them, stop their activity. For instance, an interesting uh, information uh, while uh, you know searching this, I have searched the level of opium production in Syria. And interestingly, this year there was an increase. I asked some society, uh, civil society organizations with Syrian descent why. They said all the uh, you know uh, agricultural activities at the east of Euphrates were stopped and you know plants were burnt down and replaced by opium. So there is a gray zone uh, that suits and fits uh, opium product production. There are some regions that facilitates delivering all these drugs to the west. That means no problem. Methodology first must be searched on communication and technology opportunities of individuals and organizations enjoy. Imagine that now any individual in Balkans can easily communicate with somebody in Chechnya, in Libya, in the United States, or in Europe, or somewhere else. At the meantime, uh, there's an increasing tendency of transformed acts, uh, terror acts, not only in the West, but everywhere. So, when you observe such kind of act from one another region, that means it has a diffusion uh, effect. Then, uh, during the pandemic term, everybody was at home and continued to observe what's going on in the world by means of just, you know, surging Twitter or Facebook or some other social media uh, conduits. Another issue in terms of uh, hybrid warfare, illegal trafficking of all kinds, not only in drugs, but weapons. Okay, is there any decrease in terms of weapon procurement globally? No. What about Balkans? Balkans is a good source of ammunition, for instance, and also good source of weapon production. Is there any decrease for that? No. Everybody is eager to buy something from somewhere, and Balkans are included. So if you go to the means that I have mentioned, social media, yes, and also rumors in society, and also crimes on the streets, and also maybe thefts, terror acts, radical youth organizations. During the pandemic era, uh, radical organizations were eager to reach youth, you know, more efficiently than ever, because now everybody was just before the computer searching for something and communicating with, with, uh, with each other. So if you just check, for instance, I have checked what Turkish mafia is currently doing. It was interesting because one of the key leaders was uh, in Montenegro during the pandemic, uh, you know, uh, pandemic. Interestingly, again, the uh, events in Syria or in Libya was monitored, uh, were monitored in Balkans that they inspired somebody. So as a concluding remark, I think that Balkans is one of the location that is most suitable for hybrid warfare and intertwined nature of actors in terms of ethnicity, religion, civilizations, whatever you call, they can easily exploit the means with hybrid warfare assets. And diffusion is much more easier for the last two decades. And if you add this, the bias and prejudice in the minds, either in Europe or elsewhere, it can easily be exaggerated in minds if they stay at home and uh, superpowers, big powers, doesn't matter, USA, Russia, China, or somewhere else, 
if they benefit from the uh, you know outcomes of such conflict i think it will be a kind of sample case for the small ones and medium ones so yes pandemic facilitated hybrid warfare i think we will uh, face the new and unpredictable outcomes in future thank you And now the floor is open for questions and uh, discussions. So if uh, there are questions or comments or feel free to address them to the speakers from, uh, from this panel. Well, to break the ice, how we say in Romanian, I have received some question on questions on email and uh, with your permission I'll address the the first one so as this conference takes place the Americans are voting their president for the next four years given that various reports emerge regarding the involvement of foreign actors in the electoral process in a developed country how do you assess the risks regarding the safety of the electoral process in the countries in the Western Balkans Maybe this is a question more appropriate for Mr. Greg Melker, but of course everyone is invited to offer their opinions on this. Sure, <clears throat> excuse me, sure, I can say a little bit. Um, you know, I think we're, you know, we're kind of keyed up on this. We know what's, uh, we know what they're up to last time. And uh, I think there have been, as I mentioned earlier, some offensive actions on our part against some of the perpetrators of the uh, uh, meddling in 2016. And we did a lot better in 2018. Um, so despite perhaps uh, uh, President Trump, who wants to vilify aspects of the election, but I think it's just uh, to cover cover himself if he loses and he can blame it on something else, um, that I think it's it's going to be pretty secure. And, and there may be a few minor skirm, a few a few things that are discovered that are wrong, but overall it, it, it should go well. Uh, so the question would be is, you know, our, can our success be, if, assuming that we are successful, can that be uh, exported to maybe uh, countries that don't have the same amount of resource and energy and are more more subject to uh, influence and less able to uh, to take that on? And I think that this issue should be certainly something big on, on NATO and EU's agenda to help out and to uh, um, try to uh, see the, the, the positive lessons on how to make an election work well and, and minimize the interference is gone in that direction. And as you saw there, <clears throat> I mean, one one aspect of the two activities going both from NATO and from the, uh, I assume the European Command of the U.S. going into Montenegro, I mean, one aspect of that is to ensure that uh, that we don't have the interference that occurred in 2016 or, or whenever it was in Montenegro that they interfered. Um, so I think there's some good opportunities to, to do that sort of thing and, and to help out. And maybe there has to be kind of even a you know, a standard team that goes around each country to make sure everybody's level of understanding. But I'm not sure. Personally, I don't know what NATO or EU is doing in this area, but it seems like one that they should be uh, having a concentrated effort. Get back to you. How would you correlate your affirmation that China's involvement in Serbia is rising with the affirmation of Ms. Kolibashanu that 65% uh, uh, of uh, Serbians actually welcome a deeper involvement of the USA within their uh, commerce and their cultural and social activities. Is that, is that for me? The United States in Serbia. Was that a question yeah. for me? Okay. Uh, well, well, I, you know, so, some of the, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't, I'm not a Balkan expert and day-to-day and -day expert, and I haven't spent much time there. So, you know, some of the stuff I looked at is uh, a few years old, 2016, 2018. I think there have been some efforts, more recent efforts. I know in particular uh, in September there was, uh, uh, I forget whether, which agency, I think there's a Defense Financing Corporation and our Import-Export Bank had, have had some good interaction with Serbia to uh, arrange for loans on a, I think it's on a highway, the Peace Highway, I think is what it's called. So there's been some re recent activities, I think, to change that uh, perception and change the balance of views. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, maybe somebody local would have a, maybe Jelena would have a better uh, 
understanding of what's going on there. But certainly, uh, I think recent efforts have, have made a difference and uh, shows how you can uh, kind of change the influence balance in a country. Uh, okay, we'll move on with uh, the next question received on email. Uh, the pandemic showed how much our societies lack in terms of resilience to infodemics. The EU helped the region, the EU, sorry, helped the region with recovery funds and medical supplies where more than Russia and China did, but the narrative in the public sphere promotes the opposite. Their communication strategy targeted at citizens is much stronger and people are being convinced that these particular actors are the real allies. How can this phenomenon be faced so that the EU can increase its credibility in the region? Would a stronger public diplomacy strategy be required on behalf of this, the EU here, or would it benefit from stronger national position of EU members? Can I have a very short input? Uh, this is a very good and very important question. And uh, there are various ways in which these kind of toxic narratives can be debunked. And, uh, but I think that one of the least discussed means of debunking is to acknowledge that there was some errors at the beginning. Uh, so some, some uh, input uh, in honest communication, I think, is very uh, welcome. And I just want to underline the position, the very frank apology of the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. So that was a very high level acknowledgement that in the beginning, indeed, the reaction to the pandemic was left to the national state. So there are various ways in which misinformation can be fought against. And uh, I let, please allow me only to underline this kind of uh, counter um, counteracting disinformation by honest communication from the highest level. And again, from this point of view, I think that Ursula von der Leyen did a very good job. We had very sincere apology to the Italian people, for example, that they were left alone and that their perception was somehow legitimate. I think that this very high level communication uh, um, did a very great job in putting some uh, kind of narratives on hold. Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Bergawano, uh, with your permission, uh, we move on to the next question. So the Balkans represent a testing ground of the Russian hybrid toolbox, as we have seen on various occasions. From failed COP attempts to pressure on referendums or blackmail based on energy dependency. Should the NATO and EU invest more in increasing the resilience of these states so they become less fragile facing the Russian hybrid warfare? Yelena Milic is the first. Thank you. Uh, uh, actually, it was the second part of my presentation, exactly that. Uh, first, to reply to Greg, um, the Washington Agreement from the September 4th between uh, Serbia and United States and also started which is a uh, huge good news and I think that Phil Ricker already announced that uh, Serbia will soon sign down memorandum of understanding uh, similar to one um, that Georgia and Ukraine have signed recently. So it's a good and developed. meetings with China. Actually, uh, you sh uh, the data about Serbian scope of um, change with the, uh, China is exaggerated. It is a small fraction of our GDP and the trade in comparison, for example, to Germans' uh, percentage of which GDP and trade with foreign partners. And we are in much dire need uh, and uh, we are finally witnessing in the last six months uh, that uh, other big powers are entering the field and, and confronting this investment initiative that uh, China was leading. The EU actually reshuffled its 
IPA fund uh, uh, instruments for pre-accession uh, in order to help the region um, confront the, 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 the pandemic effects. So it's the same amount of money actually, but to different allocations. It is the US pledge, uh, which is actually very interesting and works like a charm, at least in Serbia. And Serbia is in excellent position actually to build like a segue between between these and initiative first, you know, initiative between North Albania, Albania and Serbia, which now brings in Kosovo, thanks to the Americans, and very soon I hope Montenegro and Bosnia as well. So not all the narratives that we are hearing here today are profession, we are witnessing a kind of epidemic against Western Balkans uh, as we speak. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify that. And then uh, to answer to answer your question about uh, Russian hybrid the second part of my presentation was even 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 uh, experiencing some uh, technical difficulties, uh, uh, Ms. Milic, but uh, thank you very much for your answer and for your uh, intervention. And uh, we move on uh, with another question. The Balkans are fertile ground for Islamic radicalism, which contributes more to fragile states and might represent a risk to the security of the entire Europe. How do you assess this danger and to what extent the economic and social problems heightened by the pandemic could lead to an increase in Islamic radicalization in the Balkans? Maybe this is a question for Mrs. Kolibashanu, but everyone is welcome to step in. And... Um, so basically what, what could happen, and I, I actually think that Dr. Um, Murat Aksan could uh, probably add to uh, to what I'm saying, uh, but um, I do believe that uh, the risk is high here as much as we are getting into uh, more economic troubles. So, in other words, if we are going to end up having a recession or having a depression even, as I mentioned, uh, social problems are going to increase and social problems are going to make it worse for um, those underlying conflicts that already exist in the Balkans or, or have existed in the Balkans. Meaning um, the differences between um, classes will transform here into differences between ethnicities, um, considering um, access to economic growth and considering access to infrastructure. Um, so, yes, uh, I believe this is a, a high risk. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Aslan, do you have anything to contribute here? I feel like uh, you do. Oh, thank you. Thank you. May I? Okay. Uh, okay, I think first uh, we should just clarify the root causes of radicalism. Well, uh, you can fight against radicalism, but it's nonsense because you can't win it. It's not visible, it's not concrete. Uh, but if you go and just visit what radicalism is and what the root causes are, that means you can achieve with a long-term commitment. And I think that's the issue that most states and communities do not care. Second thing, uh, okay, radicalism is not only about Islam. Well, there are peoples, there are people, you know, uh, very stick to some, uh, ideologies, uh, and it may either be Islam or extreme left or extreme right. So all of them are radicals. So uh, if you just talk about the presence of a certain religion in any location in Balkans, it's not radicals. But if you talk about people having guns on the streets, doesn't matter what their religion or ethnicity is, yes, it's radicals. For instance, terrorism is a radicals. If you are stick to an ideology, even though it's uh, inspired by a religion, so it's radicals. So what should we do? Education, consciousness, persuasion, toleration, 
universal values that we desire on us must be on the ground. If you once respond radicalism with radical measures, you will just increase the level of radical tendencies in the society, mainly in one segment, and it will ignite the other. So it has a diffusion capacity that will mobilize most of the uh, most segments of the public. Uh, and please, uh, okay, the current events in Austria, in Vienna, Vienna, or in Paris, they are really bad things and cannot be justified by any religion, any ideology, because it's a terror act. But if you want wants to suppress this radicalism with a long-term solution, I think the best way is the soft means, not hard means. Thank you. And indeed, you made a very important uh, point here from, uh, from my knowledge. In France and also in Germany, the state has invested in um, uh, programs for uh, Islamic education that are more secularized, more tolerant, more integrative. And I would uh, like to ask you if this kind of uh, good practices could be reproduced uh, um, uh, within the Balkan area. Uh, thank you. Okay, if you once have a law to be implemented in society, First, you should check it, you should test it. If there's a response from the community, no problem. If community is happy while implementing it, no problem. But if the problem occurs uh, right after implementation in another form, that means there's something wrong, then fix it. I think that's what the Europeans are doing wrong. Once they decide on doing something, first, they are not persuading publics, second, they really do not know how to implement it, and they want to implement in general that makes this law or any regulation uh, lacking toleration by the public, maybe one segment of public. Well, I think communication is important here. I mean, while uh, you have a regulation, you must first persuade, and it's the soft power. I think that's lacking. So you should go and visit the people with campaigns and tell them what you want to do and what they want. And there's a, if there's a compromise, then there's no problem. But if they resist, so you should search for another solution. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Aslan, and uh, of course the floor is uh, open for questions and, uh, and uh, comments, but uh, if we don't have a... Uh, uh, Annie, I will take the opportunity and uh, ask uh, Mrs. Kolibashano, uh, that uh, you spoke about the increased uh, polarization in this context of the uh, pandemic, the, the global pandemic, the increasing polarization within the Balkan area. And uh, I would like to ask you, uh, how do you think this uh, pandemic will manifest itself uh, uh, more within uh, states or between international uh, relations? So inequalities will grow in a, at a social level or more at a political, international, geopolitical level? Thank you for that question. It is a very interesting one that uh, I, I do ask myself uh, um, actually um, often. Uh, my view is that first, we are going to see on the short and medium term increased polarization within the state. That means that socially, we are going to see a drive uh, for people um, to, to become more individualistic, if you'd like. First, because they have to take care of themselves, uh, because they need to make sure they are secure, and because they are afraid. So as long as we have the fear of the virus, and this will probably not be taken away by a vaccine, even if it will be diminished, uh, we are going to be um, to, to have to live with the fear of the virus, of catching uh, the virus. And therefore, we are going to invest in um, our own security um, and, in a sense, um, put some more distance between um, us and the other. Uh, with the economic problems coming in, uh, the distance will naturally increase because obviously um, we already have differences between classes. Um, and this is one of the driver that we have seen nationalism rising in, in Europe. 
um, and one of the the main cause for Brexit, um, actually. So the driver of all the negative events in Europe, if you'd like, um, was uh, this gap between social classes. And the most important um, being the gap between um, the population and the leadership. Uh, the fact that we are searching for a new model uh, of governance in Europe. We are no longer okay with um, our leaders. We don't feel that uh, we are represented and therefore we are searching for solutions to be better represented and for our problems to be solved nationally. Um, this in a sense, um, if it goes on long enough, obviously, um, it is a good um, foundation for driving more differences between states, something that will pose into question not only governance models um, at the state level, but also a governance model for the EU, um, for NATO, and for all other alliances uh, that group states, obviously. Um, as we are also searching, as I said, uh, for a new kind of new models for, of leadership, we are going to empower um, new type of leaders um, and new philosophies that are not going to resemble with multilateralism uh, or even uh, protectionism as we have seen it. So we may have uh, to readdress uh, through this restructuring how we govern and what does it mean to be governed. This also has a big opportunity for Europe. Uh, I believe that this has the opportunity for the European states to come together and to actually find the solution in the EU as being governed by the EU. And we have seen this happening, um, if you'd like, in the very, very economic sense of Corona bonds. So Corona bonds and the fact that the, the nation states were in agreement of actually funding themselves on the market means that they've come together and they've risked it together as the EU. And that basically leads us a step further into fiscal unity, which could be the base for our political unity. If we are not long enough in the state of um, testing the governance models for um, our national st status and if nationalism doesn't grow enough. Now, if we're taking it a step further, um, going out of the EU, obviously we are going to see which a phenomenon that has started already, uh, global competition. Um, and uh, that is, uh, in a way um, more aggressive, also because of the perception of the US withdrawal, but also because of the, the differences existing between states and because of the dependencies existing between states. So uh, in a sense, there, it's a feeling that the pandemic has offered a window of opportunity that resembles um, a vacuum. Um, and with uh, the U.S. no longer uh, being willing to be the global policeman, but still being the global policeman, we are going to see the major power uh, powers racing up to get more influence in their neighborhood. So, in a sense, um, this goes in sync with the polarization that we are seeing within um, the state. Some will be weaker and will be weakened by the pandemic and the economic problems that the pandemic has caused. Um, some will uh, seize the opportunity and be anti-fragile, if you'd like, and seize the opportunities to grow. Um, and this is where I believe that our region is actually in a very good position um, because we can be anti-fragile. I don't think there is one country in this region, in the Balkans, wider region, if you like, in Eastern Europe and the Balkans both, that hasn't gone through recently a transition period. And transition period has, uh, periods have made us uh, anti-fragile. We kind of know what, 
what restructuring means. Uh, and we are accustomed to that. So for us, we are in a good position, I believe, right now. But to, to come back to your question, it's both. It is only that is uh, going to be taken step by step. And it is up to the governments and up to the states, ultimately, uh, to manage how the social polarization um, becomes into restructuring and into a positive restructuring, um, and then take it from there to national competition, competition between states. Kolibajano, very interesting uh, answer. So basically, we should also treat this uh, uh, pandemic uh, crisis as an opportunity maybe for the European Union, coupled with the Brexit challenge, Brexit challenge to step forward in a more politically coherent Europe, steps, uh, steps forward uh, taken towards uh, the federalization of Europe, no? Maybe that could be yes, a possible. I, I, I believe that it could be an opportunity if we are not getting into an economic problem uh, and an economic crisis that takes too long to be solved or we are not aggressive enough in solving it. So there is a lot at stake, but the first step has been done in the sense of bringing together economies and talking with a common denominator on the financial markets, which is a, which is a very big step. You know, in, in, uh, in fashionable terms, it is a huge step ahead. <laughs> so, yeah. And I have a question for uh, for Mrs. Kolibos uh, Bergawanu, sorry. Uh, you talked about the overabundance of uh, information within this uh, pandemic uh, context. And I would like to ask you how uh, we as citizens maybe could obtain more civic uh, acumen in this ongoing informatic uh, battle. How should we proceed to be uh, proper informed in this whole situation? Thank you very much. So the problem that I underlined at the beginning of my presentation is that, uh, that there is an uh, overabundance of information. And uh, while the quantity, the limits of our attention is pretty much the same. So the fact that the information is multiplying doesn't mean that our attention span is multiplying, but on the contrary. So this is a structural pro problem of the current communication ecosystem with this discrepancy between information, which is going up, and the attention span, which is pretty limited. So my uh, advice that, that I, have been, I have been giving since the beginning of this pandemic is to slow down, especially on digital platforms, to be, to be very moderate in spreading information that we are not sure of. So I think that the best way as, as uh, personal citizens to counter the infodemic is to be very slow in sharing and in commenting and engaging on social platforms. Uh, this is a pledge that was done also by the United Nations initiative about the infodemic, which, which was entitled Pledge to Pause. So there is a wide consensus at the level of disinformation experts that the first step in order to stop the infodemic at the level of individual people is to, to slow down the engagement on social platforms and to refrain from making comments because if we, uh, uh, we these, are, these are viralization uh, means. So first of all, we, I think that we, sh we, should, start, we, sh we should have a, a confidence in the medical authorities. That was one of the biggest problems at the global level that the pandemic problem, which was a medical problem, was highly politicized or even geopoliticized. So, but I think that trust in medical advice is one of the best uh, way to counter uh, disinformation and infodemic. And again, pledge to pause, which is a campaign uh, run by the United Nations. Uh, Bergawano, and uh, uh, I thank you uh, everyone for a very uh, rich uh, round of uh, qu uh, answers and questions and debates. And I would like now to uh, uh, ask Major General uh, Leonardo Dino 
to uh, offer, uh, as an expert in the field of hybrid uh, warfare to offer us his uh, expertise on the on the topic and also to address the concluding remark the floor uh, is yours. thank you thank you professor uh, first of all I would like to join dr. Aslan in uh, defining uh, hybrid warfare in the Balkans I was uh, also like uh, him a little bit skeptical in defining uh, hybrid uh, hybrid warfare uh, in, in the Balkans. After a thorough research uh, that I did on this uh, uh, topic, eventually I accepted that it's a hybrid warfare. And I will start uh, uh, by uh, bringing together the opinions of uh, the previous uh, speakers in that uh, panel. And I would like also to join you and to thank for their uh, uh, important inputs uh, on this. Uh, first of all, the Balkans, uh, it's a good ground for conducting hybrid warfare. In, in the region, it's uh, vulnerable uh, to hybrid threats. Why? And I defined and I found three roots of this problem. One is the historical background. So starting with Kosovo Poly in 1389, since today, we've seen a lot of uh, uh, issues from, from the historical point of view. Second is the religion. Uh, here in the Balkans, we, we, we find three major religions that are somehow uh, uh, trying to uh, adjust each other in the, in the region. Uh, it's about the Christians, Catholics, and Orthodox, and we see the uh, Islam. Uh, also, the third pillar, there are the vulnerabilities because of the democratization process. There are young countries, young nations, after, especially after 1990, when former Yugoslavia uh, broke up. Also, I tried to define, and I, I, I mentioned that I accepted the hybrid threats eventually, when I found that uh, there are two means using. In defining, uh, and Dr. Aslan made a very good uh, point, uh, when we speak about hybrid, we have to take into account the conventional and unconventional, or defining that a, a power or somebody who is conducting the hybrid uh, warfare is using political, military, economic, including financial, uh, and other means together. And I found that if you go and you research very, very deeply, you find that there are two important tools. One is the soft power tools, and the second, active tools. I mean, somehow using active military or non-military, including intelligence means in order to achieve geopolitical or strategic goals. So from this point of, of view, I accept it. And I, also, I tried to define who is the, who are the players in this hybrid warfare in the Balkans. The most, and uh, using the, 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 the most of the tools, is Russia. And it, in my opinion, is the single one. Russia, it's conducting the hybrid warfare in the region. The other countries we mentioned in the second panel, they're having political, economic, diplomatic interest, religion uh, interest. They are not conducting hybrid warfare, but Russia is conducting hybrid warfare. Very shortly, because my predecessor already mentioned, I will speak which are the domains, the fields in which Russia is conducting the hybrid warfare. Not on a single field, but combining the fields. So I'm referring to the soft power tools, and this I will mention, the political tools, and I'll give you some examples. Uh, I mean, Russia is using the political differences between the two countries, 
uh, it's trying to block EU accession and NATO accession of the countries in the, in the region, uh, conducting different contacts at the political level in order to achieve uh, its political goals. From the diplomatic point of view, and a major example the, uh, is the implication of Russia in uh, Serbia-Kosovo uh, issue. And using also, we've seen in the United Nations uh, Security Council, the veto uh, at, uh, of Russia against Kosovo independence. Uh, I will uh, mention and uh, uh, Mrs. Koliboshanu uh, and uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Borgawan mentioned very well in the terms of infodemics, information, information warfare, including here media. And uh, I will give you a, a very strong example. In 2014, a Sputnik uh, uh, agency was established in, uh, in, uh, in Belgrade. And we've seen in 2015 the situation in Montenegro when they broadcasted the uh, Democratic Front from uh, a Montenegro protest against NATO and how they uh, exposed the, uh, uh, the reaction of the uh, Montenegrin uh, government and the same anti-NATO protest, how they uh, overreacted over this and, and so on and so forth. I'm including here the cultural links. Russia is using very much the uh, Slavic linkage, the cultural. I'm including also the religion, the Russian Orthodox Church, which is very uh, well seen in Serbia. But mostly, and we, we didn't discuss about this, in uh, Republic of Srpska. So using the, the, this, uh, the Orthodox uh, Church uh, in, uh, and the religion. I'm including here disinformation. Uh, so information in order to achieve political goals, specific, and this uh, become a disinformation. It was, in the third panel, it was very well discussed about the economic interests. Uh, so, Russia is not the biggest investor in, uh, in the Balkans. It's the third or fourth one. EU is uh, one. Uh, it's the biggest one. But uh, Russia invested in the banking, financial, and real estate. They found to, to, to preserve a, a, a financial you know, uh, engagement in the case they, uh, there is needed. Uh, also, the, the trade in the, in, the, in the region. And what is important here, and I'm going to the active uh, measures or to, uh, let's say, so-called conventional, if we can say conventional, using different uh, groups, interest groups in the, in the region, uh, using oligarchs from Russia in order to bribe uh, the different uh, political groups or economic groups in, in the Balkans. Using the paramilitary groups, and uh, I mean, somebody mentioned uh, the uh, Wagner group from Russia, but also uh, I remember very well the Black Wolves uh, motorcycle uh, club that went to, to Niche and to uh, uh, Macedonia and uh, it's very important to, to mention that. And this is a linkage, oligarchs, paramilitary, military, intelligence services. And we have a long history of intelligence services uh, in, uh, in the Balkans, of Russian intelligence services. Both the civilian one, the foreign intelligence service, SVR, and the military one, GRU. And we have examples what happened in the uh, Russian embassy in Skopje, in Macedonia, North Macedonia, and the linkage with the, the region in the uh, Russian embassy in Sofia. And I don't want to uh, come back to Montenegro in 2015. 
So uh, they are using extensively. I think it's a divide. Uh, is VR is used more for the political goals and GRU for uh, military uh, purposes. Uh, military. So the Balkan uh, uh, region, it's still dependent on Russian military hardware and uh, maintenance and uh, uh, ammunition and for whom. And uh, uh, you have to keep in mind uh, the latest shipment of BRDMs to Serbia, acquisition of MIG-29, also six MIG from, uh, from Serbia. They intend to uh, acquire helicopters and also uh, the dependency of Bosnia and Herzegovina and other countries from the region on uh, military uh, hardware, but they are not uh, uh, purchasing directly from, from Russia. The legal, uh, the legal aspect. Also, it's important to mention that Russia inherited from a legally uh, point of view all the former USSR treaties. And Russia, it's a part of the Danube River Convention, which is important because we discussed, and I remember with John Hodges, about the military mobility and using the Danube River for uh, uh, deployment of uh, 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 military support towards the eastern flank. So, uh, I will also, uh, I forgot to, to mention in the information, the cyber field. Russia, it's using very, and we've seen in the United States, we've seen in Europe, in France, using the cyber domain in order to uh, exploit the vulnerabilities uh, in order to uh, attack and to uh, conduct disinformation uh, in the uh, in the cyber field. Uh, this was uh, my my research. Um, so I did this uh, this research, uh, and it's a, a small one uh, because I'm very interested in emergent security challenges, and all this together. Uh, is uh, comprising also the uh, emergent security challenges. Uh, this, is my, this was my opinion on, uh, on this panel, and uh, I'd like to thank you, uh, all of my previous uh, uh, speakers for, for this. Uh, I was uh, charged by, uh, <laughs> to conclude the, uh, this day of uh, this conference, and uh, I would like, first of all, uh, to thank uh, Univers West University of Timisoara for hosting uh, the fourth uh, edition of uh, uh, Balkan Security uh, challenge Challenges. And uh, for this uh, exceptional support uh, from uh, uh, technical and logistical support, and especially uh, to uh, the, the uh, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Marilyn Pinta, and also for uh, uh, Prorector uh, Professor Flavia Barna. And I would like to thank uh, uh, West University of Timisoara because it is a part of this uh, program. It is very important, uh, and I discussed previously with uh, uh, people from the university, uh, that they are engaged in uh, uh, providing security culture to the young generation. And I think it's an example for other universities and for other entities in Romania, because we need to provide security culture for our young generation. When I mean security culture, I don't mean, including because I'm, I'm a former military, military. Security culture means all the domains I mentioned previously in politics, diplomacy, economy, financial. This is about the future of our country. In this context, I would like to thank New Strategy Center. I'm now a member of uh, this, but, and especially to George Kutaru, and uh, because for his stubbornness in a positive way to make this uh, uh, 
event happen in this condition uh, of uh, pandemics in, uh, in Romania. And he, George Scutaru, and uh, the, the technical support from the people from uh, uh, University of, and also the logistical support from uh, Anna Maria, it uh, merits all our applauses. Uh, I would like also to uh, congratulate the presence of local ad administration to this event. It's very, it's very important to have here the, uh, the prefect of Timish uh, County, uh, the president of the uh, council here, and the mayor. It's a very important signal that people are interested in having education and security on the same table. Uh, also, I would like to uh, thank all, uh, all the speakers to this uh, conference. It was a long day, but a very, uh, very good one, very good points, and I think for, from my point of view, it was an exceptional uh, uh, event. I would like also to join my predecessor in uh, expressing my condolences and grievances uh, about what happened in, uh, in Vienna and Austria. This terrorist attack, uh, it's an example, and we've seen in, in, uh, in France. Also, there was, uh, I don't know if it was uh, uh, named as a terrorist attack, what uh, happened in Quebec, in Canada also. So, Something has happened, and uh, there, were, uh, there are signals that we have to raise our uh, uh, attention. Finally, I would like to sum up what happened uh, this long day. Uh, the conference was uh, uh, divided in four uh, panels, very well organized, and uh, touching the political and diplomatic aspects in the first panel, uh, talking about the security challenges in the pandemic, uh, pandemic world. Uh, very, very interesting uh, uh, comments from uh, State Secretary Simona Kojokaru, and I would like to comment about looking optimistic in the future. This is uh, a, a good point, uh, the day after, after tomorrow. Uh, it's, it's important. Uh, also, it, it wasn't discussed here, it was discussed in the third panel, but I'd like to mention here, it's important to uh, look back, to uh, have lessons learned, and to improve our resilience. This is the most important lessons learned after this uh, 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 COVID challenge. Um, also, um, uh, I would like to, uh, to mention what uh, Ambassador Chalak uh, uh, mentioned, and it's important, and this because we have also representatives from the, the parliament and uh, uh, from the political uh, domain, defining the Balkan region. So time, we have to get rid of uh, having this expression, Balkanic, because Balkanic, in, uh, in the mind of different people in, in Europe and not only, it's uh, somehow associated with uh, criminal organization, incompetency, uh, non-democratic countries, uh, illegal uh, trafficking, and so on and so forth. We have step by step going and to redefine the, the region. Uh, the second panel, we, uh, we managed to define uh, uh, which are the main powers in the region, uh, very well uh, mentioned here. So we have European Union, we have NATO, we have United States, we have also Russia, Turkey, China, and some uh, Arab states. Also, we defined the, uh, the security threats uh, uh, facing the, uh, the, the region. Very, very interesting panel, it was uh, the, the third panel, economic crisis after pandemic, threats and uh, uh, opportunities. 
And I was looking to this panel, not from the threats, from the opportunities. And we have to look in this, uh, in this way. And, and I will mention some of them. We have to look to the collab uh, collaborative work, to uh, traceability. Uh, digitalization and uh, we have to look to uh, sharing intelligence and uh, cooperation partnerships in different and I will mention here the public private partnership this is the future so we have to connect the public sector with the private sector and to, to build uh, uh, know uh, the, the opportunities in, the, in this uh, domain. Uh, I discussed with the uh, uh, pro-rector uh, Flavia uh, Barna about the research. Uh, we have to uh, invest uh, in, in the research into uh, uh, innovation, in inventions. So it's very important for our future to... Uh, and I... I I was very happy that it was mentioned here, the resilience. Resilience in all the domains. It's important to have the, at least uh, the initial capability to respond to different other uh, crises. So this was one, the COVID-19, it was one, but if we look to the emergent security challenges, we can find much, much more. I will not stick uh, too much to the last panel, Thank you, Professor, for conducting this uh, panel. It was a very interesting uh, day, uh, very interesting discussions, and I already made uh, my, my comments. Finally, I would like to thank the audience for the patience and all the participating. I uh, conclude this uh, conference, and I would uh, hope that the fifth edition of the uh, Security Challenge in the Balkans will take place in the normal situation also with the support of University, West University of Timisoara. Thank you very much. Okay.